the people. You want to yep. Work with cool. but good oh, school. Excellent good. school. Yeah. I'd like to call to order the February 26, 2018 meeting of the Highland Park Board of Education. The New, Jer New Jersey Open Public Meetings Act was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice of and to attend the meetings of the public bodies at which any business affecting their interest is discussed or acted upon. In compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act, the Highland Park Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting setting forth the time, date, and location to be submitted for publication to the Home News Tribune and Star Ledger and posted on the board's website at least 48 hours in advance of this meeting. Members of the public who wish to address the board will be given the opportunity to do so before the board adjourns for the evening. Linda, could we please have a roll call? Ms. Byer? No, I thought I saw her. Nope. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Ms. Simaresti? Here. Ms. Coleman? Ms. Gowan? Here. Mr. Krieger? Here. Mr. Magaziner? Here. Ms. McFadden Di Nicola? Here. Ms. Pietrobono? Here. Mr. Roslevich? Be it resolved, pursuant to the Sunshine Act NJSA 104-12 and 13, the Highland Park Board of Education will now meet in closed session to discuss HIV reports and discipline matters. These exemptions are permitted to be discussed in closed session in accordance with NJSA 104-13. Information regarding, regarding the board's closed session discussion will be disclosed to the public as soon as the need for confidentiality no longer exists. Could I get a motion to recess to closed session? So moved. Could I get a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That's people. You want to yep. work with good oh, school. Excellent good. Good school. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to call to order the February 26, 2018 meeting of the Highland Park Board of Education. The New, Jer New Jersey Open Public Meetings Act was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice of and to attend the meetings of the public bodies at which any business affecting their interest is discussed or acted upon. In compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act, the Highland Park Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting setting forth the time, date, and location to be submitted for publication to the Home News Tribune and Star Ledger and posted on the board's website at least 48 hours in advance of this meeting. Members of the public who wish to address the board will be given the opportunity to do so before the board adjourns for the evening. Linda, could we please have a roll call? Ms. Byer? No, I thought I saw her. Nope. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Ms. Simaresti? Here. Ms. Coleman? Ms. Gowan? Here. Mr. Krieger? Here. Mr. Magaziner? Here. Ms. McFadden Di Nicola? Here. Ms. Pietrobono? Here. Mr. Roslevich? Be it resolved, pursuant to the Sunshine Act NJSA 104-12 and 13, the Highland Park Board of Education will now meet in closed session to discuss HIV reports and discipline matters. These exemptions are permitted to be discussed in closed session in accordance with NJSA 104-13. Information regarding, regarding the board's closed session discussion will be disclosed to the public as soon as the need for confidentiality no longer exists. Could I get a motion to recess to closed session? So moved. Could I get a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Can I get a motion to reconvene to public session? So moved. Can I get a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. And let's please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, and before we get started today, I didn't kind of run this by any of my fellow board members. I did mention it to Scott. Um, I just wanted to take a, a, a quick moment in light of um, everything that's happened um, in our country in the last week and a half since um, the, the shooting in, uh, in Parkland, Florida. Um, I know that there's some work that's underway. Um, behalf of the students to put something together for April 20th. April 20th is one of the dates that um, students have chosen. I think this is what, March 14th, March 24th, and then April 20th. Um, students have been engaging in all kinds of um, protests of all kinds um, um, since that shooting. And I just, as a board, wanted to take a moment to, um, to recognize everything that's um, been going on in the last week and a half and actually have a moment of silence and um, 
both obviously in honor of um, the students that were lost, and also, but also in, this, in honor of the students who are just kind of rising right on up and um, taking control of this conversation, which I, I greatly appreciate. So if we could all just take a moment. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'm sure we'll be hearing more um, between now and April 20th, which is, I think, the date that the students here in Highland Park have um, have chosen. And it's I know you guys are in conversation with Mr. Lasseter, who's in conversation with Dr. Taylor. And, um, um, you know, I have great faith that we can all come together as a community and figure out ways that we can engage in this conversation. Um, I do just a correction. It's now March 14th. Oh, okay. So just, it's been solidified. March 14th, there'll be a... Um, walk out but then walk like we're not but we're not walking out for the entire school day and then the plan is to get a highland park delegation to attend one of the rallies on the 24th either in newark or new york city okay oh, with great. possible plans for april 20th to be decided at a later date okay sounds good you'll keep us you'll keep us surprised as as time moves forward uh okay uh linda we don't have any communications on the agenda anything else does anything else nope. come in nope Okay, um, so number eight on the agenda, we have corrections to the minutes, and this is our voting session, so we will be um, taking action tonight and voting on the, um, the items on our agenda. Uh, so number 18, we have that correction to our December 18th minutes. Um, did anybody have any um, concerns with that? No. Um, and then the approval of the minutes, uh, number nine, I'm just going to move those both together. Um, for the regular and public ex uh, public and executive session from January 22nd and the public workshop and executive session from February 12th, 2018. Anybody have any questions or concerns with those? No? Okay, so um, can somebody, uh, let's see, move uh, numbers eight and nine on the agenda? I, I can do that. Okay. So I'd like to move um, that the board uh, accept the recommendation of the superintendent to approve the correction of the minutes as follows, and approve the minutes of the regular public and executive session January 22nd, and the public workshop and executive session of February 12th, 2018. Okay, can we get a second? Second. second. Any discussion? No, nope. seeing none, Linda, can we get a roll call? Ms. Simarosti? Yes. Ms. Coleman? Yes. Ms. Gowan? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Mr. Magaziner? Yes. Ms. McFadden Di Nicola? Yes. Ms. Pietro Bono? Yes. Mr. Roslevich? Yes. Okay, that brings us to our student representative report. Um, hello, everyone. So, for Irving, we have uh, there, the students took part in the Magic of Science program that the PTO provided for us on Monday. On Monday. Um, the kids learned concepts in science, including chemistry, light, magnetism, optic illusions, physics, and mathematics that were demonstrated in an energetic performance, perfect for children. Um, everything performed had a scientific principle behind it, and each of the topics appeared to the audience as, ch as a challenging and astonishing magic trick. The kindergarten and first grade teachers will be taking part in professional development with George Street Playhouse this week. Uh, through George Street Playhouse Creative Dramatics Theater Arts I Integration Residencies, the Irving staff looks forward to exploring how theater arts education positively impacts students' social and emotional growth in the early grades. These opportunities will provide imaginative, differ differentiated learning experiences for children to, de to develop artistic expression, expand language acquisition, and collaborate with others. This experience is scheduled for the weeks of April 9th through May 21st and is funded through the generous support of the, of the Provident Bank Foundation. <coughs> and they are extremely excited and thankful to, to have been awarded two grants from the Highland Park Ed Foundation. One will provide for a sensory room which will foster academic, social, emotional, and motor development and enhance the nurturing environment at Irving. The other grant will provide staff with books and CDs as part of the building school of introducing the teaching staff to culturally diverse materials. And finally, this Friday will begin their Read Across America Week and families will have the opportunity to join uh, Irving for a whole school reading period next Monday. Okay, so from Bartle, uh, Bartle's International Visiting Students Program has its second round of students visiting this week. Students receive a certificate of attendance and appreciation at the conclusion of their experience at Bartle. 
Bartle held its second resp responsive EPIC community meeting in February. Students recommitted themselves to the core values and vision uh, of leading, leading by learning, empowering others, appreciating individual differences, and doing right by others. Bartle acknowledged and celebrated the first 100 days of schools uh, with school-wide and classroom learning activities. And teachers and students alike dressed up in character and created artwork to hang on walls and then to go home. Bartle is engaging in the third annual Pennies for Patients initiatives where students have raised over $2,000 for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. This event is being spearheaded by Bartle teacher Brooke uh, Baldiz Baldizoni. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Bartle is, uh, has acknowledged the Chinese Lunar, Lunar New Year um, and the halls of Bartle are decorated with students' red lantern artwork and other displays to celebrate the Year of the Dog. Bartle held its first ever Fuse Open House, hosted by Teresa Dolan and Dr. Christina Nicosia. Uh, Bartle Student Council meeting was held today. They still have a record number of 50 student representatives that continually attend student council meetings on a regular basis. Bartle students were happy to enter the Human Relations Commission of Highland Park poster contest and provide the artwork that represents the All Are Welcome Here decals. The Bartle Student Book Club has started to research and incorporate more books that represent diverse authors that speak to the, the diversity within Highland Park. And finally, Bartle will be holding its second annual Read Across America Parade and parent read-in with st uh, staff and students. The parade will follow Bartle's Halloween parade route and the read-in will occur in the Bartle Gymnasium. So as for the middle school, uh, the middle school held its Black History Month celebration on February 20th. Um, hip hop promoter and producer HPHS alumni David Rush was the guest speaker and pre presented his inspirational story to all the students. Uh, the middle school band, choir, and orchestra all gave, gr gave great performances with songs all written by African American artists. The middle school young gents introduced the celebrations, and both teachers are two teachers and students presented works by so Sojourner Truth and Langston Hughes. The middle school diversity club was honored for their work in promoting diversity and acceptance and working towards change in the middle school. The middle school also participated in the NJ regionals of the National Middle School Science Bowl at the Princeton Plasma Ph Physics Lab and placed fifth out of 16 teams. Uh, it was a great experience for the students to meet, watch, and compete against the best rated teams all over New Jersey and a total of 16 schools participated in the competition. Highland Park Middle School was represented by two teams. Team A, Isaac Wu, Jacob Marsh, Jason Liu, Johan Yu, and Richard Zhu. Team B, Christine Chen, Elliot Lee, Noah Shapiro, Patrick Zhang, and Yuchi Zhang. I'm sorry if I mispronounced any of those names. Um, the Team A advanced to round seven and placed fifth overall, uh, where we lost a close match with Witherspoon, 104 to 94, um, who then went on to be the finalists. The middle school ma Mandarin classes celebrated the Chinese New Year by making delicious dumplings in the middle school cafeteria. The students are also hard at work on their new rap songs in Chinese that they share with a cooperating school in China. Um, can we have that for our middle school? Please. Student spotlight. We want the middle school Mandarin kids here rapping in Chinese, please. Um, all of the middle school creative writing classes wrote, lo wrote letters to the survivors of the Maj Majory Stoneman High School in Parkland, Florida. Um, the students expressed that not only, not only their sadness for the occurrences, but also gave compassionate words of hope and solidarity to the, Flor to the Florida students. The middle school students enjoyed their Valentine's Day dance. The venue included a DJ, light refreshments, and meal in a candy bar. Both students and staff, staff relished the music and festivities. And finally, the eighth grade students had a chance to discover the electives offered by the high school during the HS elective fair on February 12th, 2018 in the high school gym. The eighth graders were greeted by high school students who explained the various options for music, technology, business, art, and other programs. Their eighth and, ni their eighth and ninth grade gu guidance counselor, Ms. Stephanie Miller, will be meeting with eighth graders individually in March in order to discuss their course requests for next year. And then finally, we wrap up with the high school. The DECA Club will be attending the annual state competition this week. Um, and they actually all left school today, uh, right at the end of the day. There will be over 40 Highland Park students competing. The Model UN and Congress team will be sending 20 students to Mexico City this week for a four-day conference and a cultural immersion experience. Uh, we leave for 4.15 a.m. tomorrow morning. <laughs> One -tenth and of them are delegates the are very much looking forward to meeting their partners at the sister schools. Uh, we're visiting three this year instead of two like last year, visiting um, pyramids that are just outside the city, uh, the Frida Kahlo Museum, practicing Spanish language skills, and trying lots and lots of amazing food. 
Student Congress just gave out their February fundraising grants to uh, several different organizations within the school. So $500 went towards funding a school bus, um, not, actually, not a school bus, funding public transportation tickets for the GLOW program to take a trip to New York City uh, so they can practice their real world skills and um, both within the city and getting there. $250 were awarded to Global Awareness Group for help in funding their bracelet fundraiser uh, that advocates for an end to child slave traf trafficking. And $50 went to the um, Saga Club for, a, for several pr uh, pride flags that were to be hung around the school, um, kind of in connection with the various flags and nationalities you see in Center Hall. The girls' winter Can track. Can you just say what Saga is, just in case anybody doesn't know the acronym? Oh. We have oh. so many acronyms that we all think straight everybody knows. Straight and gay alliance. Yeah. Gay straight and gay alliance. Yes. <laughs> um, the girls' winter track team won the Group One state championship title on February 18th, and finally, congratulations to the Science Bowl team that tied for fifth place this past weekend. Uh, the team was made up of Kevin Marks, Elizabeth John, Carrie Lee, Noah Hartwick, and Eric Chen, who made it all the way to the ninth round. Excellent. Thank you so, so much, you guys. How many kids going to Mexico? 20 of us. Nice. Including these two. <laughs> <laughs> so whenever you need to go. Nice. All right. Thank you both so much. Uh, it's all yours. A couple of shout outs. A couple of shout outs. <laughs> you guys give the most comprehensive reports yeah. consistently. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. No also, um, one of Highland Park's favorite sons is working the camera tonight. Uh, uh, a shout out to John Gartner. Hi, Ooh, John. Hi, John. Thanks for coming in. Uh, John has also applied to be our videographer for the rest of the year. Great. So you may see a recommendation to the board sometime uh, in March on that. So um, tonight we are um, honoring one of our high school, one of our high school's favorite sons. And we're also um, going to be hearing about the uh, U.S. History II with Honors Option program. So first, I'm going to introduce Mr. Lassiter to take the podium. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, and thank you to the Board of Education for uh, having the high school here tonight. just want to make one quick uh, correction to those wonderful students. It's actually the Sexuality and Gender Alliance. Um, they changed their name a while back, and it's not well known um, to be more See, I'm glad I asked for the acronym. There, there you go, and that's why I wanted to make sure that we all know Saga is more than just stray and gay uh, at this point. How do I uh, call up the next student? Principals aren't supposed to have favorites, uh, but I actually have four favorites in this room, so um, I guess it's okay to call up a favorite um, uh, daughter of our school, Uchechi Ode Conway. I want to speak about her as our superintendent spotlight first. Come on up here. I don't need any prepared statements for Uchechi. I've known Uchechi since she was in middle school, um, and she's come a, a long way. Um, last year, she was actually our student of the year, um, voted by all the teachers, um, and won that honor last year. But she came into her junior year in such an impressive way that I need to just understand that this woman is all around uh, one of our Renaissance students. Um, she is not only started the year as a football player, not too many girls do that, uh, but they went on to basketball season. And, and while all that's going on, she's juggling Model UN. She is one of the four students in this room going to Mexico tomorrow. Um, so I'm glad she's here tonight because she just finished her drama practice uh, for the play um, and was a star last year. And I, I'm looking forward to her performance in Adam's Family. Um, but most of all, the timing of celebrating Uchechi is perfect because she is one of our students that took on the US2 honors option this year and is thriving with it. Um, and so um, she does deserve that round of applause. Yeah. But most of all, Uchechi did something that not a lot of students do. Uchechi wrote a thank you letter to the entire Highland Park High School staff um, that I told her I was going to share with uh, the faculty and um, we did it right on uh, uh, the, the meeting right before Valentine's Day and it, was, it just softened everybody's heart and just reminded us just how great Uchechi really is. 
<laughs> I never really got to thank you all as a whole. When I was young, I never really thought I would do anything in my life where I was just taking up space. I felt like that until I became a ninth grader. Many of my teachers, previous teachers and current teachers were very nice to me, passed down their wisdom to me. This school has not only been kind to me, but let me have the opportunity to make friends, get out of my comfort zone, give me good memories, but most of all, made me feel like I matter. I can't even fit all the thanks I want to write down, but for now, thank you. Love you, Cheshi. And that's the same reaction we got in the faculty. Room. So without further ado, uh, I think we need to recognize you, Chechi, as our student this point, um, I'm going to reintroduce you to reintroduce. Nah, introduce go ahead. Take it over. Take over, Mr. Just Lassiter. Just want to get the uh, presentation started over there. I'm going to recommend that we slide yeah, over yeah, yeah. so Mr. Oh, Lassiter oh. can project. Yeah, oh. Yeah. Oh. Great. He was a student teacher. Twenty plus years ago, it's hysterical. It's in his office. Oh, in his office. Oh, I see. I see. Go get some sleep, please. Oh, so <laughs> Okay, we did send out a letter uh, inviting parents to come. Last uh, February, we actually uh, did a similar presentation on our whole goal of this with a promise that we would do another presentation a year later. Um, I sometimes think that uh, when we don't have a lot of people come out to these meetings, they must be happy with what's going on. So, um, going to begin with Dr. Taylor because all of this really comes uh, in link with our district strategic plan. Um, we were going to have some teachers here tonight, uh, both Mr. Gold, uh, who's leaving at 4 o'clock tomorrow for uh, Mexico, and Mr. Broadfoot, who's currently on the DECA trip as a chaperone. Um, these are uh, two teachers that have helped lead this uh, expansion and this honors uh, option, um, but they're doing other things for students tonight. Dr. Taylor, did you want to speak at all about the strategic plan? Or you want me to just, got it. So um, we all know that the Pathways to Excellence is our strategic plan. Um, I always relish the fact that we have a strategic plan. Um, I've been here for 25 years, and not until Dr. Taylor did I ever even hear the word a strategic plan. Um, so it's great that we are really trying to focus on things we've needed to do uh, in our district for a long time. Um, I've always believed in mixed ability classes, being a middle school teacher, um, and having mixed ability classes for years as an educator, and implementing instruction assessment strategies that help differentiate 
the instruction for each learner is, is the goal that all of us have in this district. So how does that look at the high school level? Well, students are all given the opportunity for success at all levels and an open policy to students and parents to waive students into higher level courses exists. So if a student is not recommended for an honors or an AP course, they still have the right uh, with their parents' support to help waive and choose to take a higher level course than they're recommended. However, our students are encouraged and recommended to take the most challenging courses possible and then the teachers would differentiate to their needs. Sometimes that is always in alignment, um, but we always try to work very hard to uh, give the students the options. So how has this looked in uh, junior history and what has been our, our history in these courses. And so way back when, um, when I first was involved um, in administration, uh, US 2 honors and AP US history were about the same. Um, and then you can see over the years, there's been a gradual uh, movement to more students taking AP US history uh, than taking US 2 honors. So what we decided to do this year was to change things up a bit. Uh, to set up an on-level history course, no longer referred to as CP, because for some reason college prep has gotten a bad stigma with the students. When they hear CP, they think, ah, oh, that's the low-level course, it doesn't mean anything, and it's not going to challenge me. Well, CP means college preparatory. So I've taken out the term CP out of the program planning guide. I've asked all the teachers not to use the term CP, and referring to courses, because we're a college preparatory high school. Okay, and so this year we offered US History II or AP US History. And for US II, we gave the students an honors option. That means they did not need to pre-select before coming into US II in September to be in an honors course. They could make that decision once the course started in September. We also encouraged the AP option heavily uh, through guidance, through the teachers, to really be in, involved in recruiting kids and telling them that AP is a good thing. Um, and we're doing this more and more, especially as we now have 15 AP courses at the high school, um, which is uh, impressive for a school our size. Um, we're also on the AP honor roll and do very well with the students that take the AP courses. They score threes and higher. And so we get a lot of attention for not only the number of students that take AP courses, but how well they do in them. And um, like I said, there's always been a number of students, because we've only run two sections, who would have taken AP US history, but just couldn't because it wasn't offered in enough sections, and uh, they might not have been able to fit it in their schedule. So this year we have one more section of AP, and honors was offered this year as a result of increased enrollment and the honors option flexibility in US two. So you'll see, we've always usually have uh, two sections of both. This year we ran three sections of both. Uh, and look at the numbers. Now we may have less honors students, but we have significantly more AP students uh, in, in US history. And what I did is break down for you the way the honors option classes look. So there are three sections, one with 16 students, one with 22, and one with 13. Um, and I'll talk to why there's an imbalance uh, in a moment. And you can see in the 16th section, it's perfectly balanced. Eight students in honors, eight students in regular. The 22 student section, um, which Uchechi is in, uh, has five students in honors, 17 that are regular US history, but this is an ICR section, meaning it's an inclusion class. So the numbers are higher and there are two teachers in the room. Um, which also means that our ICR students had a chance to take an honors US history course. And our Class of 13, um, three honors and 10 regular. A little imbalance there, um, but we'll speak again to that later. USAP, pretty well balanced, three sections. And so how do the students make their choice? And the numbers don't quite add up to the numbers we have because we do have some seniors in the mix sometimes when it comes to US 2 and it comes to AP US history because their junior year, they might be overloading on science, they might be overloading on math, and they can't fit that history in, and they're only required three years of history anyway. So these numbers are lower um, and don't quite match because of those reasons. 
The number of 10th grade US-1 students who selected US-2, 35, standard. The number of 10th grade US-1 students who selected US-2 honors, now they upped a, le a level. Eight of those students uh, moved up a level. The number of 10th grade US-1 students who selected US-AP, now we have four students that went from US-1 to AP. That's unheard of usually. The number of 10th grade US-1 honors students who selected US-2 honors, um, six. And of course, most of the US-1 honors students selected AP. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about diversity because clearly our goal is to create mixed ability classes and that is going to involve increasing the diversity as well and doing everything we can to try to change the way that we do things. Now, if you look at the junior class last year and the junior class this year, the percentages are slightly different, but pretty much the norm. And now, there are more students this year in 11th grade, 128, but as you can see, the diversity was pretty much the same. And US 2 honors, you can see, is now quite different than it was last year, okay? Now, the numbers might be less, but what does that mean when the numbers are more diverse? It, it makes all the difference. Um, and it really changed the way that US2 honors and those students that are taking the honors option um, look and, and act and, and, and now are challenged in ways they may not have been uh, previously. USAP, not that much different, but there is a difference, okay? And you can see the numbers. Any additional student taking an AP class is a gain. Might only be four students, but it's four students of color that may not have taken AP in the past. How are they doing? Well, for the most part, they're doing fine, okay? When we look at the students that began in US-1 and chose the US-2 honors option, and remember, they're going up to an honors level, look at their grades, okay? Their current averages, A's and B's, their midterm projects, A's and B's, mostly A's. Those that began in US-1 and chose US History AP, look at their overall grades before you look at their midterms. Okay, their overall grades are fine. A, B, and even a C in an AP course from someone that came from US-1 is not a bad thing. Okay, it really isn't. Um, AP is a tough course. It's a college level course. Now their midterms, please look at the phrase after it, in line with the AP exam. The teacher has to create an exam that will give them practice before they're going to take the AP exam. So they're taking a college level exam and they're still <coughs> passing it. Okay, they're still passing it. Okay. Now let's look at uh, those that began in the honors class and what they are doing. Okay, you can see all the honors US1 students and US2 honors are getting A's, midterm project, uh, still A's and B's, the exempt medical issue, um, don't need to go into it. Those that began in US-1 honors and chose US history AP, um, there's where you have your student that's not passing. Um, it, it's a more significant reason, um, but everyone um, mid-year might not be doing uh, well for various reasons. However, when you look at the majority of students, they're, they're right in line with success, okay? And they're all passing even if they didn't do well in a midterm. So you might, meet, might think, well, the course isn't as hard in US-2 honors, and maybe there's uh, some reason the kids are just getting uh, grades that they're getting. And so Mr. Broadfoot conducted a survey. For a couple of his students weren't available, they were absent when he did this, but when asked if students liked the idea of an honors option for classes, eight said yes, one said no, and three didn't have an opinion, probably because they had never been in an honors class before. When asked if they think the honors option is as rigorous as separate honors classes, six said yes, three said no, and three said they didn't know, again, probably because they hadn't been in an honors class before. When asked if they would rather be in a separate honors class, four said yes, seven said no, and one really didn't matter to that particular student. Now this is an informal survey, so I decided to do a formal survey. And so I called all 16 US History II honors students to the library. I, I missed a couple, they were absent. 
okay, and I got 13 that were there, and talked to them about um, the rigor. I gave them a real specific question, reason they selected the course, they, and they could select more than one. So nine of them said they wanted the challenge and rigor. Eight of them chose U.S. Uh, History II honors uh, for the GPA considerations, four of which had been in U.S. I honors. Teacher assigned the course, three of them chose the course because they knew who the teacher was going to be. Other one was worried about public speaking in AP and said, you know what, I don't want to go in AP, I'd rather be in U.S. History II honors. And so I asked them two other questions that were more um, anecdotal and they could provide a, a lengthier response. The students were also asked if the course was challenging and rigorous, why or why not? And do you believe you chose the best course for your needs, why or why not? And so I looked at all the responses um, and counted up the number of positive, the number that might have the concerns. Eight students said yes to uh, that the, challenging was, uh, the course was challenging and rigorous and described the course as being challenging enough and more work than they had done in CP in the past. Five students said no and described the course as not having a lot of homework, um, which in all honesty we've been told not to give a lot of homework to the students this year, and not as many essays. Okay, so some of the students actually asked for more writing, which Mr. Broadfoot will get that feedback. Students said they should have taken, or two students uh, said they should have taken AP, um, which is a good thing. Now they know, take on that challenge. Do you believe you chose the best course for your needs? Why or why not? Ten students said yes, and explained that they feel like the extra work helps them. It is a good middle ground. I am challenged just enough, and I'm a little upset that I didn't try honors before I like the challenge. I thought that one would be particularly touching and I felt the same way when I read that. <laughs> Three students said uh, the course was too easy and one of those said AP would be too hard. So really, only two courses, or two students thought it was too easy, one wasn't really sure, okay? So what should we do next? Um, obviously, we're gonna see how the kids do throughout the full year. Second half of the year does tend to be a little bit more challenging than the first half of the year, um, particularly in AP as they're getting ready for the AP exam. Um, US 2 honors, now they've gotten all the basics down. Uh, Mr. Broadfoot can do more differentiation with the students and uh, take some of this feedback and give them some extra essays as well. Um, but we will continue counseling for students to choose challenging classes. That's been my mantra with the guidance counselors. Okay, teacher recommendations are a guide, but the waivers do allow us for changes based on student, parent, guardian input. Okay, the students may not be trying hard now. By their junior year, sometimes they really step it up. And so a recommendation from freshman, sophomore year doesn't mean as much um, when you're going into your junior year and you might want to take on that additional challenge. Okay, we're going to continue the AP expansion goal for all students interested. And in honesty, 15 courses, we're... we're getting pretty much to our max, um, but some of those courses aren't as rolled as high as they could be. Um, and many of our AP courses, we do have two sections. Uh, there's only a few courses where we only have one section of the AP course, uh, like music theory or um, uh, computer science just began this year, but I wouldn't be surprised if we have to expand it. And we really would like to consider strongly adding more honors option classes. And so on this note, I asked a few uh, teachers, would you like to try this? And my world history teacher almost knocked me down with excitement, okay? Because we've never had an honors option at the ninth grade level in world history. And having that option within the world history class might challenge some of our ninth graders to step it up a little sooner. Okay, my English 11 teacher is also incredibly excited about the possibility and kind of already does it. Um, the curriculum that they're doing in English 11 and English 11 honors is the same. All he does is differentiate his lesson plan based on the students and what they actually might need in the honors course. And if the English 11 course has an English 11 honors option, I might be able to balance those uh, US 2 honors option courses out a bit more. Not to mention our AP Lang and Comp class, which is a junior level AP course, is maxed at 60 students in two sections. Um, they literally overflow out of the classroom on certain days so they can work with their laptops in the hallway because the access point won't hold 
all their Chromebooks and their devices probably at the same time. So, um, yes, we, we really want to expand this. And in fact, in Spanish and French, we've been doing this for years. Levels three through five are almost always a level three, three honors, a level four, four honors, and a level five, five honors in the same class anyway. So saying to the kids at the beginning of the year, you know what? Maybe you want to choose honors now would be better than, than having to make that decision last year um, going into their junior year or senior year. So um, we like what we see so far, and we really would like to expand the opportunity to all students. I was actually going to recommend that we ask questions at the seats in case you want to go back to the slides. You can use my, my mic, my wandering mic. I have a question for Mr. Lasseter while everybody's resituated. Yes. Um, it's an on-the-spot question that I haven't, we haven't discussed this before. Okay. Terrific presentation, by the way. Thank you for the research that you did. I Mr. Laster has been working very hard with Mr. Broadfoot over the last two, I'd say at least two weeks, putting this together. Yeah, about two weeks Thank putting you. this together. Uh, you and I have discussed the positive reception that we're getting from the staff about the honors option idea. Could we be even more aggressive than what we're seeing here in our expansion plans? I tried with a few other teachers, and I've got to be honest, I've only focused on humanities uh, first. Um, and some teachers are a little wary in regards to what that might look like. Um, senior year, it's a little bit harder, I think, um, for students to, and I'll be honest, I focused on senior level teachers after I focused on some of the junior humanities teachers. Um, and if they haven't done this before, all of a sudden say in senior year, you want to opt to do an honors section, not likely as successful. Um, on some of the other grade levels, uh, conversations need to be had. Um, science and math, there's still some strong hesitancy um, about trying to do something like this um, because differentiating in, those, in, in the math particular is one of the challenges um, that we do have. Perhaps some of the work we're doing at the middle school in the area of math can be a model for what and, you might want to scale And up. students coming in with that kind of experience will definitely benefit us greatly in regards to trying it out. So her, I've got the mic, who wants it? So the question I had as you were going through the slides, and again, thank you so much for putting all this together. My pleasure. We appreciate it tremendously, it's so helpful. Um, is there the thought, it, it was really, it, it seemed really striking the difference between the classroom grades and the midterm grades. Um, and it made me think that some of these students may just not be accustomed to taking that kind of an examination. And is there thought to maybe then build that in for the students who are, are stepping up to one of these classes, maybe build in some sort of study skills and some sort of how do you prepare for a test like this, especially before, I mean, now we kind of see with their midterms, like they, they weren't completely able to show what they know on that midterm. Um, maybe show what you know as to elementary school, but um, um, you know, to give them that, that additional assistance within the classroom framework before they get to their final. And so let me speak to that for a second. Um, this midterm grade for AP uh, U.S. History definitely needs um, to have a little bit more training that goes into it. Our U.S. One Honors course, though their midterm is very rigorous um, in regards to the types of things that they're expected to do. A lot of document-based questions. There's always a sizable multiple choice uh, section. But when you take the AP U.S. History um, midterm, you're trying to cover all of U.S. History um, in one course. Um, and so that is one of the challenges. And we've even talked about um, the U.S. One Honors is almost seen as AP One um, for U.S. History. Um, and so there's definitely some, some conversations on how to best address the kids' needs, get them ready for this. Um, but I want to caution that this midterm is so different than others. This is their first real chance to get that real exposure to the test, and then they learn from their mistakes. Um, because the midterm's only worth 7.5% of their overall final grade. 
Um, so it doesn't impact them in a way, as you can see, with their overall averages. They're doing fine. Right. And I guess my, some of my concern also would be, though, just if this is your first big examination when you're moving up and you bomb it, like, how does that make you feel about your, your ability to do this again? The teachers do a real good job of, of going over the exam, um, talking about what they could do differently, how they should study, what they need to study, um, and moving forward. And we have a couple of students in here, and I'm not going to put them on the spot, um, but they, they've experienced it, and I don't know how they've, they've done on that AP midterm. I'm just curious. And like how we did on the midterm? So I what are your how, grades? How you feel <laughs> about the midterm in general. I mean, I think how you feel about that particular midterm, because I know you've both taken it. Um, I, th I think, because I have friends in a push this year, um, the midterm was, is a little, was a little different for us last year than it was this year. Um, I think there was more, it was more heavy on writing. Um, it was, I think, I think ours was just a multiple choice test last year. Um, so I don't really think I can attest to okay. that. Um, but in terms of the class, I felt prepared for the A push exam from the class entirely. So. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll speak to that. I actually brought these numbers here after Julia goes. Um, yeah, I think that, um, well, I, re I don't remember having a problem with the midterm last year, though it's possible that it was slightly different. It's absolutely true that this class requires a lot of outside investment because you have to review an entire year's worth of history at the end of the year to take the test. And so that can be really challenging for students. And then, But I also think that um, most students just aren't used to taking a test like these AP tests are. And so the midterm is sort of this wake up call and then you spend so much of any in any AP course, not just um, A push, doing DBQs and doing all this stuff so that it actually becomes much, much easier. So I think that like, you know, up until this point you haven't done as much and the midterm is, is like a wake up call, but I don't think it has that kind of I think if, if you, I think the idea of bringing AP for two years possibly, having A push one and A push two would actually be really beneficial to this because if you're seeing these scores could be better. Would I would I feel, think we would all feel better if these scores were in the U.S. A push one, like in, in sophomore year midterms, and their fir that was their first time being exposed to an exam like this, um, and so they were at the AP level for the two whole two two years instead of just one, um, and then so they have more practice with the test, and so by the time they actually take the exam, it's like second nature. So that's what I would recommend. And so uh, I appreciate both of your feedback on that. Um, let me talk to you how this might measure up in regards to AP performance. Um, U.S. history, AP scores last year, uh, 36 out of 42 students got a three or higher. That's 86% of the students that took the AP exam. And 50% of those students got a four or higher. Um, and so um, the scores have really been good. And one of the main goals of AP, as we all know, is to get the kids if they take the exam, because we don't require it, um, and they get the three or higher, then they can save some money in college. And so we really try to push uh, the kids to take the exam, train them to take the exam. Some, and I'm a big believer in you learn from your mistakes, and it really helps the kids to understand this is a serious test. I've got to work a little bit harder than I did in the past. While I have it, it, since this is really a junior level focus, um, even with our AP expansion in Lang, it's been great. Um, 45 out of 49 of those juniors got a uh, three or higher on the AP Lang test. That's the 92% uh, rate of students getting a three or higher in that particular exam as well. And so our students did good in AP last year. We'll look again to see, did all this help? Or, or potentially impact the scores in another way. But we don't evaluate our teachers by the scores. I'm giving you those numbers. The numbers speak for themselves. The teachers don't get the pressure that they have to get the scores because our students don't have to take the test. They take it voluntarily. Um, and we just subsidize for the students that can't afford uh, to take it. So this goes to this, um, this idea of uh, looking at scores for next year. So obviously we don't know scores, but we did just the, the deadline for registering for AP, at least the for the $94 test instead of the 100 whatever, just end, like, finished. So do we know how many students we expect to take the APUSH exam relative to last year? Because, like, it, it, are these grades or whatever, or 
having to jump the course and that already being too much, is that discouraging people from taking the exam or are we saying the same kind of enrollment? I can't answer that question. You definitely put me on the spot since the <laughs> registration just closed literally right. on Friday. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, and we have a new AP coordinator who I have to ask her to figure out how she can yeah. get all that information together. But I promise um, you'll have that for the next board meeting that you can bring it back. Um, this is just kind of out of curiosity, but how many of the students in US in the normal US one or US two are likely to take AP government? Are they at all likely, or is there um, any possibility that they? Great could? question. Uh, again, can't answer. We haven't even uh, begun really, just barely scheduling the students for their senior year, um, and having them choose the Gov course. Our Gov course, though, traditionally runs two sections um, because I need to. Um, with about 50 total students taking AP Gov. Again, that's completely an elective now um, because they only are required the three years of history and that doesn't count towards one of the, the state requirements. Okay. I have a question. So, uh, thank you and this is fantastic news. Very, very exciting. I think uh, particularly um, as we were talking about this last year, and now knowing um, the level of, of success and participation levels, um, with uh, especially with regard to the honors option. And could you describe for us the, um, so w what additional are the kids doing who are doing, the, who have chosen that honors option? Can I add on to that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how does it work? Do they, at the beginning of the year, say, I want honors option? Can they move in and out of it? Okay, so the honors option was offered to them in September. Uh, Mr. Broadfoot, myself, and Dr. Taylor actually kind of coordinated on the letter that we would uh, give the students and the parents to consider it. Um, by the middle of first marking period, they had to make a decision um, and select the honors option. So they had a chance to kind of see what the different assignments might be, what some of the expectations might be, and it also gave the teacher a little bit of time to recruit as well some students that might have been on the fence. Um, when they selected that option, assignments were differentiated in regards to A, say if you have a group project, now you're the honor student, you're the group leader, okay, and you're working with your Shark Tank or your, your team to come up with whatever presentation, whatever project that you're doing, um, and coordinating all that and being the spokesperson for your group. So those that wanted to avoid the public speaking uh, that might have been an AP didn't avoid the public speaking in US2 honors option. Um, additionally, um, any assignments, any projects that were given out, there was a different level of rigor expected in regards to results, whether it be more pages, whether it be uh, uh, more sources that you had to use, um, and how you had to vet those sources, the expectation differed. Um, and the teacher, and again, this is our first year, so he's still fooling around with it. Um, oscillated between a chronological approach to history and a thematic approach. He had traditionally taken um, the chronological approach, um, but felt that that wasn't gonna work, especially as he tried to pick up the pace a little bit. He realized I'm gonna leave some of the students behind, so I gotta slow down the pace, and that's when he started to opt more towards some of the themes um, that he was looking at with those students. Um, of course, their midterm project, um, because I did stress to the teachers, I want you to try to do project-based if you can. Obviously, an AP teacher, no, you need to give them a, a practice test and, and do something in that regard to get them ready. Um, and so all his students had projects, and of course, the honors students had significantly more expectations, and his results were off the charts in regards to, now, as a teacher, the best practice is to take some of your best products and use them as models for the next year's course. He didn't have a lot of those strong models to hold up uh, to the students that were in regular US history. Now in that same class, students could, you know, I could have done that. Right. I, 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 I could have done that. Right, and, okay. so, and so going forward, um, two, I, I, my, I guess my question is two, two ways. One is how can we back it up a year or two years so that the kids who are in, ninth grade uh, and 10th grade um, can start thinking of themselves as honors level ability students who can do that work as well as to have more kids who put their hand up which is so exciting to me 
and say, I want to, I want to try that. I saw these kids do it last, you know, this year, first time, and maybe have more of them do it. And Rob, Great I think idea. some of that is going to come from what Scott is talking about, right? Like now we're not tracking it all in Bartle, where historically we have. Now we're looking at the middle school. Right now, the only thing that's tracked in the middle school is math, and we're looking at doing. So, I mean, Mike said this as well. If, if you're sending me kids who don't already have the stratification system in their right. DNA, basically, then he can do way more starting in ninth grade. So that's kind of the that's the goal, right? Is that we just we start them from pre-K and they're just they're all used to being together. They don't they don't hit that part where they that point in school where they go into the stratification system. Right. Um, and, and I just want to make sure, Ms. Yeah. Gowan, I did address your question too, right? Oh yeah. You okay, good. Um, I just want to go back. Um, Okay, I am a little upset that I didn't try honors before. I like the challenge. And so um, I, I, I just got to harp on that because I don't know which kid wrote that. I can imagine because I know which kids were in that room in front of me filling this out. Um, but that speaks volumes. And so when I asked, again, my ninth grade world history teacher, do you want to do this? And she about knocked me down with excitement. That speaks volumes to being able to start those kids with this right away. Our long-standing belief, and those that know me know I'm a social studies teacher by background, has always been in the social studies department. We need to keep our kids as mixed as much as possible. And so that's why world history, when we had a world history honors class, I was a teacher then so I can say this, we all undermined the heck out of it so that it would fail because we knew it was bad for kids. The book that we were forced to use was ridiculous, and the course didn't last. As soon as the teacher who got hired that year to teach it decided he didn't want to necessarily stay and he left, we just took that opportunity to say, well, maybe we shouldn't offer the World History Honors anymore. And we got rid of it. And so that opportunity in the ninth grade will, will spread like wildfire. Right. By expanding in our 11th grade to show the teachers, hey, if we do this, you know what? Classes are going to be more balanced. You're not going to be packed at the seams in some of your AP courses because we'll be able to spread them out with more sections. Okay, that's what happened in U.S. history. It was two sections that were packed to the brim. This year, it's three sections, well balanced. And so it will really help in that regard, and that should help fuel the fire um, to move forward and give those kids those opportunities to get that challenge. Um, just in terms of college transcripts, um, so, a, like a there's a big there's a re, there's a big emphasis put on making sure that you have honors and AP classes on your college transcripts. What is this class going to look like? It says US two honors on their transcript. Okay, right. Just wondering. Okay, and so if they take the English eleven honors, if we offer it with an honors option, they will get English eleven honors on their transcript. And in fact, the weighting goes right along with it. Okay. I had a oh I'm sorry. I was just going to actually piggyback really quick off of um, Ann's question, because I'm not sure if you answered it or not, but if there, if a student is in the um, HP honors option just as regular, can they move up during the course? Did you say Thank you. No, I, that was a good question, and I did kind of, uh, I talked about how they choose it. So um, if they miss the deadline, um, it kind of makes it a little bit difficult to then, because they would have missed all that challenge going into um, uh, second marking period and third marking period. So we really try to stress once you make that decision, you can stay there. They do have a little bit of, of a window to say, you know what, I don't want to do this now and, and to back off of it. But no student has done that yet. Okay. Well, that's the way you set it up. That's what, that's what we talked about last year. Right. And, right. And, and you're following those guidelines, which is Absolutely. fabulous. Absolutely. It's great. I'm so grateful for this presentation. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, and my question is, I guess, more about the faculty, because you said that they were, like, super excited about it. And um, I guess specifically the English faculty is what I, I wanted to know more about, because when I decided on a major in college for myself, I chose comparative literature, because I loved history and I loved literature. And so that was a good way to bridge those two things. So what you were saying about wanting to have as much diversity in the classroom in a history class, for me, that translates also to English. And you know, having more um, diverse 
things to read and more diverse perspectives on that reading, to me that makes sense. So I just wanted to know what you and perhaps the faculty had to say about that, um, especially for the ninth graders coming in. Can't speak to that just yet, okay? I'm still working with the faculty, um, trying to make sure that I can get everyone on board. Um, we also have a new humanities supervisor, so we have to have that conversation. Um, and the last thing I want to do is force it. And so I'd rather pilot it, show the success, and then demonstrate that this success is going to have an impact on your class um, and, and let the teachers kind of buy in that way. And I guess that was, if nobody else has a question, maybe I'll wrap it up with and, that question. And I, I, I will add one thing. Just remember, English 11 honors are on board already. Okay, so um, we have the chance next year to potentially set some ground work for really spreading, spreading the fire. I'm wondering if you have any sense um, for what the dynamics are like in the classroom. I know we had some students last year who were sort of very resistant to the idea of a heterogeneous class. Um, others were, oh, were you know, excited about it. Um, I know you said you try to, the teacher tries to uh, sort of mix people up in groups so there'll be some honors kids and some not honors kids. Um, do, do you feel like the kids are sort of getting along? And so, in all honesty, Looking one of the other. students that responded out of all the students I formally asked, did say that they didn't like the two teachers were in the room and that they would have preferred to be in an AP course. Okay, so. They didn't like the two teachers. Huh? Yeah, there the, the was one student, but out of all the students sure, sure. that we asked, put that out there. Um, and I know what that means, and, and we all know what that means. Right. And so um, I just go back to, now this is them telling Mr. Broadfoot directly, um, do you like this? Most of them said yes. Okay, is it as hard as you expected? Well, and some of them may have been those students who had never taken an honors course and said, oh wow, you know what, I could have done this a long time ago. Right. It's not as hard as I expected, okay? And if they wanted a separate, seven of them said no, okay? And I feel like I just totally missed something. There's two teachers in the classroom? For the one, oh, one, one, one section with ICR. Oh, the one, oh, the one, one section. section with the ICR, yeah. I see, and that now has a reputation as being sort of the, which okay. is, it's not supposed to be. Right. All, all I'll say is that some of the students that stepped up in that room, again, were students that were classified students, Yay. and they now had an honors option because we can't, so I'm sorry, we just don't have the manpower to run an ICR honors right, right, right. section. Okay, but when you split it up and honors is available in all the classes, now we do. Yes, that's so great. So, anybody else? No, no. Okay. So then, the last thing I'll ask is: Is there? Um, uh, do you have plans to take your presentation on the road with the staff to just kind of put the bug in everybody's ears? Absolutely, ear, so going to share it now with here's... everybody. Um, uh, the two teachers that were involved with it know it well. Um, I haven't shared it with the whole faculty. I wanted to work with Dr. Taylor, make sure the board is behind it, um, and then absolutely we'll take it on the road. Expected more parents here tonight. Invited a whole bunch of them, but this will be available on our website, um, and I will encourage parents in my next letter to look at it. Um, and if I get the sanction from the board, like I said, all it takes is a course proposal to say, next year we'll be offering English 11 with an honors option and world history with an honors option. I, I, I don't... I can't see any objections sitting around the table, so. I didn't think you would. <laughs> the PDF version of these slides is in the board drive in the superintendent's folder, so you can mass distribute it if you'd like. Mr. Laster, thanks again. I just texted you my thanks. Well done. And uh, that concludes my report. All right. All right, again, thank you so much, Mr. Lasseter. Yes. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. We appreciate all the effort and the presentation. Um, okay, so we'll move on to our board committee reports. Um, Michelle, okay. you go first. So the first item, as usual. And ladies, you're leaving us, yes? I'm sorry. Oh, yes. That's right. We have a fantastic. Uh, is there somewhere that you, like, things get posted on social media for the whole class that we can follow you guys or your adventures? We have an Instagram and a Facebook. Like, the, the, there, club, the does. club does. The club does? Can you tell everybody what it is in case? We can try. It's at HP Monk. We can try to post as much as possible. At HP. M -U -N -C. At HP. M -U -N -C. M -U -N -C. 
see. Okay, yeah. so anybody at home and who wants to follow our fabulous students while they're in Mexico. <laughs> we also last year brought a presentation to the board, so I don't yeah, know yeah, if yeah. that's going yeah, to that happen. Yeah, that time would be awfully <laughs> exciting, you know, like to like see where you guys are. <laughs> We'll have no like pressure. Geo trackers. Yep. Yeah. No pressure. Yeah. <laughs> Commentary. Well, not we're not that extreme. <laughs> Just you know, a little picture now and again would be fun. Have All fun. right. Have a wonderful time. Thank you. Get Thanks some sleep. Good night. Good night. Okay. Sorry, okay. Michelle. No, not at all. Okay. So. Uh, first item, as usual, is approval of field trip requests, and we had gone through that before uh, last time we met. So, if you have any questions. Um, I'll just keep moving on. Uh, number two is the approval of the HIV incident report for November, and um, and I'll just mention now we're right. going to write we're going to change the language in that a little bit um, for number two uh, for the November reports. We're going to change the language to I move that the Board of Education accept the recommendation of the superintendent to accept the findings of our special counsel David Rubin regarding the HIV incident report. Thank you. So that's how that will read. The number, number two. two. The H can you give yes. Send me the I absolutely can. Okay. Sorry. No, not at all. Um, moving on to item number three is the appro approval of the HIV incident report for December. Um, nothing is changing on that one. Number four is approval of the university graduate students um, with one addition from the last agenda. Um, we have Gabriella Giovanetti um, as a nursing student um, being placed with our nurse, uh, Janie Mazur. And now we have Emily Tenenbaum, a PhD student placed at the high school with Mai Ping Yang uh, for science. Number five is the approval of new courses at the high school starting uh, for the 2018-2019 school year. And those two classes are Mandarin 1 and 2 um, for uh, five credits apiece. Number six is the approval of the 2018-19 district calendar. And I know that we had lots of discussion last time, so I'm anticipating more discussion on number six. Number seven is approval of a full day of Handle with Care recertification training. Um, for the following um, staff um, on February 22nd, which I guess this is retroactive. And number eight is approval of the Teen Center Director observ Observation Rubric, um, which I don't know that we have any information on. The template's in the board drive. Okay. This standard operating procedure, we've been using a template and uh, we haven't had the board update uh actually approve it we we really should so oh. i'm backpedaling a little bit and making sure that we cross our teeth and dot our eyes uh all evaluation tools are um approved by me only after i've collaborated with whoever's impacted and in the case of bargaining units of which our teen center director is not a part of we actually have to have the bargaining unit up officially approve among its constituents the evaluation tool. Okay. So anything that you get by the time it got to you has been vetted. One clarification I want to, about well, two actually, I want to make about the calendar. We, um, I actually took the board's input about the calendar specifically to make the co parent conferences. Um, at a certain, October, right? Correct. Was, yeah. uh, we, so if you can look at the calendar, I'll pull it up now just to clarify specifically what it now shows. We, well, actually, there was the board's recommendation that we go to end of October. Um, I do need, I, I hope by now the board has had a chance to look at what we are finally recommending, and it is to maintain parent conferences during the week of teachers break, teachers convention week. The teachers professional relations committee met and felt that that was still the best week for us to have conferences. So that so would be the week, I'm sorry. The, the, the week dates. of the teachers convention. 
Um, that was the which the is November fifth, sixth, seventh, and I. That okay. was the board's ultimate, if I recall, um, decision, because it felt that that week was already spent on election day and teachers' convention. Okay. The other note I need to make is something Mr. Magaziner caught, which is a typo. We fixed it. So that'll be updated uh, before it goes out to distribution. Okay. So we couldn't make a dent in October, huh? <laughs> nope. Okay. So hang in there in October. And February 5th is Chinese New Year, right? Yes. And that's, can we just indicate that on the calendar? Yeah, just, should have I been think, there. Yeah. You're right. Fixed. Got it covered. And there's days in March that are parent conferences, but those are not detailed under the month of March. Maybe we should label those? No, they are. No, it, it's in very fine, fine print. Oh, maybe it's very, very fine. Very fine. I can't print. Print. Yeah, it's to Is that enlarge the page? Ours look right. different. Okay. So what, what I'd like to make sure is that we label every cell yeah, yeah. that's been shaded or mm -hmm. filled it with some kind of a design. Oh. Uh, I think, no, it's a PDF. I'm just viewing it. Okay. Let's see, under March it has. Yeah, this is the one I clicked on. I guess this is. And I plan to distribute the calendar this week. Oh, Pending board approval. I didn't share with you. No, I know. Okay. I don't know. Let's you want to like, take a look at this? Yeah, yeah let's take a look. Thank you. This is in the drive for, yeah. for this week. Okay. So we're not doing blackout days. We're just doing individualized, just, um, you know, students that are getting, you know, permission to not take exams or do homework on those days that might yeah. require. We haven't done those in a while. In a while, yeah, yeah. I, I do direct the teachers not to assign homework on holidays. And I need to remind everybody of that on occasion. Right. If you catch my drift. Right. I was thinking because um, Hanukkah is December 2nd, I think, that begins on December 2nd this year. So I don't know if that requires a reminder or if, you know, the fall Jewish holidays require any kind of labeling on our calendar just to remind our staff. Well, I'll likely do that in September. This is a matter of course. And we do have three days off from school for the Jewish holidays in the fall. So Oh, in September, yeah. Uh, we should definitely be abided by that directive. Okay. Yeah, I know that Hanukkah shouldn't be a problem, but it's just yeah. so far from Christmas this year. Yeah. Sometimes it's a good thing for, I'm, I practice, I'm Jewish, yeah. so sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing. It depends okay. on whether you want to space out your gift giving. Or else you have families with mixed religions, right? And then that's the whole that month of a, December. Yeah. <laughs> a month long, a month long holidays. All right, so we're good on the calendar? That's good. Yep. Where are we? I'm sorry. I was oh, out of the room. End of so curriculum. I am done with curriculum. All right, you are done with curriculum. Okay. Yeah. Does anybody have any additional questions for Michelle? Uh, not necessarily for Michelle because we, we talked about this during the meeting, but uh, I, going back to Mandarin 1 and Mandarin 2 uh, for the high school, did we have any community input on whether or not we wanted to have uh, Mandarin 1 and 2 in the high school? Or no, I, I didn't gather really input. I mean, we decided last year we'd make a commitment if we're going to do this. It's pending interest. We have 50 students in middle school taking the course, so I feel like we, uh, and 12, I believe, are 8th graders, so we do, we do owe it to them to have a follow-up course. And at this point, we're not losing a we're not lo for high school. We still have French. Yes. Mm -hmm. Those who were enrolled in it will continue their studies right. by the time through their graduation. If they want to. That's right. They, they can switch out. I mean, they yeah. want. I mean, there's only what's the requirement? Is it two, two years? Yeah. So, I mean, I think most take longer though if they're college bound. They usually yeah, usually there's three yeah. for college bound students. Mm -hmm. But you could have a student who's taking two years of French and decides, you know what, I want to mix it up, take two years of Spanish or Mandarin. Yeah. 
choices are good. All right. Rob, you good? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so we will move on to finance. Uh, Mark? Yes, thank you. Um, before we go through the uh, list of agenda items, I had a few uh, small things to report on. I think they're not small in terms of scope, but they uh, I won't take much time. Uh, first is the budget. So we've had three of our four budget meetings. Um, the, the state uh, did put off when our preliminary budgets are due until March 29th. And so uh, with Scott's um, and Linda's uh, guidance, we've put off our fourth meeting and possibly fifth budget meeting until March 29th, uh, March 19th, excuse me, and then again on March 21st. And by then we'll have, we should have state aid figures. So we'll be able to actually work with the numbers that we will get as opposed to trying to put a budget together uh, this week or next or even the week after without knowing what the state figures will be. Um, and the board meeting, um, I don't know if you were going to bring this up, uh, Darcy, the board meeting needs to be changed, right, mm -hmm. from our original schedule uh, from uh, March 19th to March 26th so that the board can vote uh, on the 26th uh, so that we can then hand the preliminary budget into the state on the 29th. Right. So that March will look like February did where we have a two-week right. break in between our meetings instead right. of a one-week one week break. Right. Um, I do want to say uh, this is uh, my third year in this position of talking about budgets. Um, and uh, we've always talked about how hard the budget is and we've got to make it, uh, we've got to make a budget that works and we've got to balance it and, and so on. Um, this year is, is um, more than extra hard. Um, I want to give a couple of examples. One is that the state has told us that to plan for a 16% increase in medical insurance costs. Um, and that's, that's uh, by both contract and by just the state uh, um, providing the, uh, the health plan, uh, the health insurance plan for the vast majority of the districts in the state. Uh, that's the number we have to live with, and that 16% uh, is an increase on about a fifth of our, uh, sorry, a sixth of our budget. So a sixth of our budget is going to go up by a sixth, um, and in effect eats up virtually all of our 2% cap. Just that one item, and it's not at all under our control. Um, in addition, you look at, uh, there's going to be four or five items today where uh, in finance, uh, I don't know, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, around there, where we talk about students going into special ed placements uh, with costs, uh, in some cases, in excess of 100,000. We also have no control of that. The one thing we do, um, uh, we don't also have control, but we have to match or follow is this 2% increase in the, in the budget, um, which has a little, a little leeway. But we, we, it's very hard for us, is what I'm getting at. It's very, very hard for us to stay within budget. Um, I would call this a, an austerity budget. We've been meeting, and uh, while the committee and the administration, and I'm sure the board, is looking to, to hold class sizes to where they've been, which is one of the kind of last places that we can get some money from, um, everything is on the table. This is a, just a very, very bad uh, year, and if we, the budget is going to have to be uh, much more severe and austere than it has in the past. So I just want to alert everyone. Uh, perhaps the state aid figures will help us. Uh, the state aid in, in real numbers have gone down over the last 10 years, so I don't know. I don't know if that, they're going to help. We'll know soon. Um, but we're trying our best to keep the educational programs, and, and that's, the, that's the best we're going to do. Uh, it's not, not a good time. Um, okay, on to more cheerful items. Um, demographics. This is the one-year anniversary also of the demographics report, and I did email the board a report I put together. It's, it's 
a little technical, but it's uh, interesting, and it was interesting for me to work on it. And I w discussed with the Finance Committee, which has been very, very concerned with the numbers that we got last year at the uh, from the demographer, which showed as many as 2,000 students in the district in 2021-2022. Uh, and, and would be really pushing the space that we have in the buildings, not to mention the financial uh, uh, impact and ramifications of that. So I went back to the report. Um, I found some problems with the report. Uh, you can see it in the follow-up that I worked on and presented. Uh, the biggest problem was some double counting of students who had already started in the district because at least one of the one of the uh, one of the, the new uh, developments uh, has been in place and, and started taking uh, 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 new new people into units in 2011 and 2012. Those were counted as just a basic increase uh, by the demographer, as opposed to an increase due to new building, um, and comprised a good percentage of the increase we've seen over the past uh, four or five years. So. Um, again, read it. I don't want to go into it in great depth, but I concluded that we should expect an increase of between 120 and 180 students to the current uh, approximately uh, 1,620. So we're talking uh, numbers that are much, much lower in the 17 to 1,800 students uh, from the 1,620 uh, as opposed to as many as uh, close to 2,000 students. And, it, and it's, it's a big difference. It's a big difference in expenses, and it's also a big difference in, um, in uh, uh, what do we do with the configuration of our classrooms to fit that many students. Um, the third item is much more mundane, and that is um, there been, had been reports um, of a recall of some products from Pilgrim's Pride Company. Uh, they make uh, chicken products that are used in um, uh, cafeterias, school settings, and so on. And Linda gave me the information that Pomptonian, which is a food service provider, uses Pilgrim's Pride, um, and that this recall done by Pilgrim's Pride uh, might have affected us. In fact, it didn't. We have a, a letter from the company, the, the, uh, the plant that produced a small run of of uh, potentially um, uh, bad food uh, was not uh, sent to any of the Pomptonian um, uh, um, uh, uses and, has, and, and would not affect our students or our, our cafeterias. So I just wanted to report that out before going on. So that's a short report, try to keep it short, uh, before going into the ag agenda items. Um, so on the agendas, um, uh, one, which is our bill list, has been in, uh, added. We have two added, which is the bill list from January 16th to January 20, uh, 31st. The athletic bill list, the same. Two, well, the three was in our preliminary workshop meeting, and four is a new list from the end of uh, beginning, middle of February to the end of February. Um, item five and six are the same. Um, that's the cafeteria bill list. Uh, the uh, travel reimbursement was in the workshop session number seven. Um, the eight, nine, uh, ten, and eleven are all, um, I'm going to call them boilerplate. Treasurer's report, board secretary's report, no, no budgetary line items have been overextended. Uh, sufficient uh, funds are available to meet our, our obligations to the rest of the year. Um, and uh, budget transfers from one line to the other. Item 12 is uh, contractors. Uh, we discussed two weeks ago the first two. The third item the, uh, is the pay for the musicians for the spring musical. Uh, the next item is uh, educational evaluations from a psychoeducational consulting group. Next item is nursing services during the uh, DECA trip. And the last item is, uh, is the approval for a uh, occupational therapist. Um, items 13, 14, 15, that's what I was referring to before, are new or changed special education placements. Um, one of them, which is uh, item uh, 13A, 
uh, at the rate of $17,930.40 is actually a move, and it's a, it's a decrease, believe it or not, of approximately $50,000. So even though the number is very high, we're actually saving money. Uh, and that's an example of how high the special ed placements are, and really nothing we can control very well. Um, 15 is a settlement on a um, special ed um, uh, special ed agreement to for a child to go to a, a, another school. Um, items 16 and 17 are acceptance of grants. Um, the item 18 we discussed or went over last time was a uh, uh, submission of an, an update of our three-year preschool program to the state. Item 19 is the request for proposals that we have to do this year for custodial grounds and management services. Um, item 20 is a tiny increase of 0.3%, not 3%, but 0.3% in um, some school busing for um, uh, uh, handicapped and item 21 is uh, grants from the Highland Park Education Foundation, Educational Foundation uh, in the amounts uh, listed below uh, to four different programs in our school for which we are very, very thankful. And that's it. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, does anybody have any questions for Mark on anything he reported or anything on the agenda? No? Um, quick question. Yep. About the occupational therapist, is that uh, someone who's providing services during the school day? Yeah, Just correct. We had to outsource because we maxed out our, our current employee services. I see. Okay, thanks. Okay, if nobody else has anything for Mark, um, I do just want to say a quick thank you for taking that deep dive into the demographer study. I haven't had a chance to read um, everything that you provided to us, but I look forward to doing so and Please. will do so because this is something, as you know, that I've been gravely um, concerned about. And it, it seems like the direction that we're going in taking our dive into this is maybe things aren't going to be looking as bad as we thought that they were going to be looking, which is extremely hopeful because <laughs> well, like, we, as, as, I, as I see it, we don't need another massive issue on our plate right now. Uh, what, what I wanted to say is there were not only some errors in the report on double counting, but we also have the year behind us so we can actually count right. what's actually happened in the right. last year. And so the report talked about an increase from 1640 or 1650 at the time, number of students, to um, a, a bound of like 1680 to 1720, but we've actually seen a decrease in students. Right. That's the thing that tipped me off. Something just didn't make sense. and and. There was, there was an ability to count the number of students that we're getting from these from these developments, and you can you know you could uh, I got a Linda helped very much the a redacted list of just addresses so I could you know process that on the computer and get how many students are coming from the developments and the numbers are there. Um, if we hadn't had the development, our numbers would be down probably by close to 100 students now. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and then you, they had birth rates in the reports. So you could look at birth rates over the years. And our largest grades right now are, are uh, two of our three largest grades by far are our 11th and 12th, current 11th and 12th, but the early grades are much lower. So you can see this pattern of, of kind of a wave motion of children yeah. through the district. Uh, it is, I believe, will be much less bad than we thought. Right. I mean, you know, it's good for, to get stable. some good news and, and more stable for us. Right, and the good thing is that we've put these kind of like methods in place, for yep. lack of a better word, to yep. kind of look at this year by year. Yep. You know, we've already been collecting the data so we can keep an yep. eye on it. And if it's, you I, know, if we I, start seeing this huge upward trend, then we can, you know, panic. But um, right now it seems like we, we don't need to panic. So and my right. conclusion, my last conclusion in the report is that the Finance Committee should be doing this every right. year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, I mean, an outside demographer is fine once in a while. We can do it ourselves. It's right. not very hard. Right. We know where the kids are coming from. So um, it's something I hope to be able to do next year at this time as well. Great. All right. Thanks so much, Mark. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, so let's move on to personnel. Judy? Okay. Um, we have a few 
few new things um, from last meeting, but I'll just run through the agenda and highlight those as we go along. Um, number one, acceptance of a resignation of a para, um, and Noriaz Molina. Um, number two is, n is new. It's an another resignation at the middle school. It's just a Schedule B position, um, the girls spring track uh, coach. Um, approval of the change of the videographer. We were talking about that. Um, we have a replacement teacher over at the middle school for special ed. Um, we have approval of a swim competition chaperone number five. Approval of full-time para at the middle school, number six. Um, this is also new, the next one, number seven. Appro approval of a para at Irving School. We're gonna move that um, we accept the recommendation of the superintendent to approve a full-time para, Kyle Malinowski um, at step one. And number eight is also the approval of a maternity replacement para, um, Audra Zadati, that is on the agenda. Number nine, we went over last time. We just have the addition of one um, other after school program assistant at Bartle, Amir Wright. Number 10, I'll give a little explanation. Um, right, we had a substitute at the um, middle school for the orchestra and strings. And because the position is um, was open. We, the, the sub actually was a certified music teacher. So we have decided to hire him to finish up the school year. Um, the personnel committee felt like because we couldn't do a full search mid-year, the, the contract will just be through June and then we're going to advertise the position to see you know, what kind of pool of candidates we get. Scott's also going out to do a job there at both TCNJ and Montclair, which are both you know, known for their um, music ed program, so so we'll see what happens with that. But we are covered through um, the end of the school year, so that's good news. Um, approval, a couple of approval of Schedule B positions on number 11. Um, 12, let's see. Oh yeah, Mr. Gold has moved up uh, a step because of his master's degree, so that is on there. More source for teachers, uh, that's pretty standard. And then I think everything else is no I don't think we have anything else new um, approval of Paris for the conversation cafe urban dragons um, approval of staff for writing lesson plans more dragon subs um, not nothing really different from what we talked about last time let me just glance through yeah I think everything else is is the same that I reviewed last time, so okay. I don't have any more additions. Okay, great. Uh, any questions? Anybody have anything for Jim? I was just going to ask about the uh, swim chaperone, because over a lot of years we have not paid. that. Th those have been volunteer uh, parent positions. I'm wondering, uh, did we not have a parent available to volunteer? No. Did we ask for it? Not in this case. Uh, and the Mr. Post actually has a background as a swim coach, so I thought it would be the ideal person to partner with the students in this case. Okay. Okay. Robbie, you have a question? Uh, number ten, the mm -hmm. music teacher of orchestra and strings. Was that also done with uh, student involvement? It was. We had a parent, student, uh, several teachers, supervisor of humanities, Mr. Lassiter. Okay. And then I interviewed the candidate in the final round. And by the way, I was very upfront with the candidate about my position. I pointed out that he may be, I'll be in the mix for the next round, but because we had conducted this search somewhat mid-year, I wanted to go out and give it another go. Oh, okay, because this yes, does he end can. June 30th. Yeah, so yep. he can reapply for the position when it opens up. And then um, going along with that, is there uh, a movement at this point to have a uh, replacement for the fall concert that was canceled? 
happening this spring? Yeah, I believe the concert was already held. Oh, okay. If uh, it wasn't, it's coming up. I gotta talk to my son then if it was held. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell you. It's good. <laughs> Okay, does anybody else have anything for Judy? No? Okay, so Anne, you wanna walk us through the policies? Yep, not too many changes. Um, for first reading, um, I'm recommending that we approve 3281, inappropriate staff conduct. Where's Keith? He's not around. Um, when you know policies are coming, uh, coming up that impact the teachers, you know, how we can loop Keith in, um, early in the process, you know, like last time he had the feedback for us about, well, the K to six teachers don't email with, you know, so. Oh, yeah, we did fix you know, that, yeah, but yeah, there's so like we, probably other things. Right, right, right. Yeah, but just moving forward as we're looking to work on, or if we know that there are policies that we're gonna be working on that have a direct impact on, on staff. Absolutely. We, yeah, get that input, okay. All right, does anybody have any questions about the, the policies that we're moving tonight for first and or second reading? No? No? Okay. Uh, thank you, Anne. You're welcome. And you're planning a new, another meeting soon. As yes, right. very soon. All right. Uh, so we'll move on to equity and excellence. The Monique. Okay. Okay, we did meet, finally, for the first time, meeting with equity and excellence on Valentine's Day, February 14th. Aww. Um Yeah. So, but we got out in time to enjoy Valentine's afternoon with our family. Um, and really the first item on our agenda was uh, for the benefit of myself being a new member, and that was looking at the comprehensive equity plan review process, which I know all of you all are already familiar with, but I wasn't, and I just wanted to get some you know, information as to where we are in the process. Um, and so it was helpful to hear from Jen Knapp um, in terms of what the areas are that we are were found not in compliance in and uh, what's being done in those areas. So I'll just share kind of the update that Jen gave because I don't need to get into the background necessarily on the plan. Is that correct? I can leave that part and <clears throat> move on to the areas that Jen Knapp discussed that are in review currently. Um, the first area is equity and discipline, um, which was, as Jennifer said, an initially an issue in the high school primarily, but is now um, sort of spilled over a little bit more into the middle school as well. Um, so that's the first area in which we are under review and are taking corrective actions in. And the second area is underrepresentation of girls and racial minorities, students in gifted and talented and or advanced classes. Um, so Jen said the district basically is needs to show progress towards improvement in each of those two compliance areas and she will be updating the equity plan with current information on what's being done um, in the district in terms of those um, action areas. So she did share a couple of updates. She said, again, actions are ongoing, but in looking at equity and discipline, we talked about the professional development and training opportunities that are ongoing for the leadership team and the teaching staff. Um, Dr. Taylor did share some uh, pictures, I think at the last board meeting, showing some of the um, sessions that are have already occurred um, and some of the really uh, deep dive discussions that are happening amongst the um, staff there and and the leadership team. She also talked, Jen also talked about the work being done by a committee of students, teachers, and administrators, um, and board members as well, to review the disciplinary code, um, and that's ongoing, uh, and also to make sure the disciplinary code reflects a restorative justice-centered model that the school district is taking as a whole. Um, so again, not a whole lot to report in terms of um, uh, results necessarily in these areas, but the work is ongoing and we really are in the initial um, stages. Um, the second corrective action area, we discussed access to higher level classes, which, I mean, Mr. Laster really just spoke to um, and just really went into complete depth of in that area. We only skimmed the surface in our discussion in terms of um, Dr. Taylor sharing with us the U.S. history honors options and what was happening in terms of in terms of our concern, and that is how how were minorities and underrepresented groups taking advantage of the uh, additional classes? And we were very encouraged to see the numbers and to know that there is growth there. Um, 
you know, we did express concerns about making sure the students who were taking that class um, and who it may have been a stretch for, whether it was the honors or the AP, and Darcy, you kind of spoke to this, what kind of support, um, you know, would they need to help them sort of adjust during the transition. But, I mean, even looking at the presentation, it was nice to see that as a whole, I think all the students were really sort of clustered together and, and doing well. We didn't see any outliers, per se. Um, and I think the main area of concern was the midterm um, exams. Uh, I will say that we talked about the importance of still being able to figure out how to provide support. And I know Dr. Taylor did say that obviously there's a budget, there's budgetary constraints, um, and so there really aren't the funds to be able to, to do a whole lot where that's concerned. But um, one thing we want, do want to consider is possibly grants um, and get to get support for some initiatives. Because as we do expand and make these courses, these higher level courses available to more students, and particularly, again, with this committee's concern and opening up access for underrepresented groups, um, I think we probably probably will find, and we talked about that, some kids who are going to need more support. Um, we just wanted to be prepared in the district to see what we can do to help those students. Um, so then in conclusion, Jen Knapp just advised us on the timeline. She said that the statement of assurance will be due in September, and it must show that the district is continually reviewing its progress in the corrective action areas. The next full comprehensive equity plan must be written and submitted in 2019-2020. Is that correct? Yeah, okay. Um, so the second discussion item was the cultural competency audit. Um, Dr. Taylor shared with us the report findings from last year um, for committee members uh, to review. We, he highlight, we didn't really get into the meat of it, but he did share it with us, and we'll follow up on that discussion in our next meeting. Um, he highlighted some of the professional development opportunities around cultural competency, um, which is really cool to see, um, including, a two th including most recently a panel discussion and a Q&A at the high school. Um, on cultural competency in the classroom. And this panel, which myself and a few other board members were able to uh, be there for, um, was really a coming together of local educators um, and community activists. There was an educator from the Perth Amboy Schools. We had our own um, Ashton Burrell there, um, a, a rabbi, um, and I forgot his name, from Rutgers University, who's also a local um, or a nearby resident. And we had... Um, Ms. Awesome. Oh, yes. <laughs> there you go. So really, um, I was impressed with just the um, perspective and the exchange of ideas and information that all of the panelists gave. And what happened was they all did kind of an opening um, discussion of bringing their perspective from whatever their cultural background was and also pairing it with their experience as a student, either growing up in a um, not so diverse school setting and transitioning to, let's say, a predominantly white institution, which was uh, what was shared by um, uh, uh, many of the participants. And it was really just interesting to hear their perspective and to share some little nitbits, nitbits from each cultural um, background, right? So we heard a little bit of the Chinese background and how teachers can take into account um, the Chinese cultural and ways of relation um, in terms of how they interact with their students and their parents. Um, I didn't stay for the full discussion, but I do know that there was an extensive question and answer period, so the students and the teachers and staff that were there were able to really have an exchange with all the panelists. Um, so again, I think it was, it was very productive and it really did, I think, help push that work forward. Um, Dr. Taylor did talk about um, the leadership team also reading uh, or beginning to read a book called Cultural Responsive Teaching and the Brain. Um, so that's also incorporated into their um, work around cultural competency. Um, then another topic that came up in our meeting was uh, if there are any culturally competent curriculum for Black History Month. Um, the question was raised, and Dr. Taylor did state that there is no specialized Black History Month curriculum, nor is there one for the Holocaust. You did mention that as well. Um, but aside from the segments that are kind of embedded into the broader scope of the curricula, there really is no um, dedicated curriculum in those areas. So Dr. Taylor did mention that since high school curriculum is up for redesign, it's a good time to consider ways to implement those specific um, curricula and diversify it for different learners. Um, and the last item, or second to last item that came up was grading. Um, we discussed grading inequity, such as vast differences in the number of tests or assignments given by different teachers. Um, Dr. Taylor's in the 
process of getting feedback. I know from staff and teachers on that. Uh, but this did lead to also a discussion on the dependence of internet access for homework assignments and how in some classes we'll see that more so than in others. Um, and just the impact that has on students who may not have that access at home. Um, so I know that's something that will be uh, followed up on as well with the staff. Um, and we also touched on minority recruitment which is something that I know we talked about briefly um, in the previous board meeting. But one area we did um, talk about tapping into is just the Greek organizations and possibly using their vast networks to um, you know, address reaching more uh, minority potential teaching staff here. Um, challenging area, and we acknowledge that, but I know Dr. Taylor is working some of the um, various uh, networking opportunities and just trying to again, hit HBCUs, the, you know, the Greek organizations, and visit as, much, as many of the various um, panel discussions that may go on to as well at Rutgers. Uh, so we're going to try to just be as aggressive as possible with it. But it is a, it's, it's an issue that a lot of districts struggle with, and we recognize that. Um, and then the last topic I want to get into, which is really exciting, is the um, anniversary of desegregation in Highland Park. Just this week, actually, um, the website has a dedicated uh, page to the, well, 2018 does mark the 40th anniversary of desegregation in Highland Park. Let me back up and say that. And if you go to the home page of the HP schools, on the right panel there, uh, the first bullet point actually is um, where you can get to the dedicated page, which provides a link to um, a whole host of newspaper articles um, from the time period documenting the process uh, of the state uh, mandate for de desegregation, the town's response to it, um, and you know the ultimate um, uh, decision and, and that was approved by the state to actually close uh, one of the elementary schools um, so that all of the students would be able to go, would go to all of the schools and the three elementary schools would not be segregated based on um, uh, where students lived, which hence li led to um, the gross um, imbalance in terms of the racial representation in each of the schools. Um, also on that site is a link to a PowerPoint presentation, I believe it is, that gives a timeline um, an historical overview of desegregation in Highland Park. Um, so very, just a good wealth of information. I think we talked about, you know, how do we hear it as a, as a town, and we're grappling with, you know, all of our initiatives to um, expand access and, you know, really talk about equity and, and the discipline imbalances. And I don't know if we all had a chance to, like, at least skim through the articles, but there were a few things that, um, really struck me um, and you know one of them really was the fact that if we I think the percentages were the racial imbalances were obvious but what also occurred after the racial imbalances were fixed right by desegregation was that the classes became um, you know racially imbalanced with tracking so you know and that kind of mixed ability or not mixed ability grouping so you know I just and that was brought out in one of the articles, and I just thought, well, here we are now, you know, on the 40th anniversary, and really taking this issue head on, um, which is a huge testament to how far we've come, because, you know, there's one thing to say we've desegregated, but what's happening within the classrooms? Um, so I don't know if anyone else, you know, picked up on some of the ways that what happened. Here, here's mine. Oh, 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 well, yeah, all your <laughs> post-its. I went through. The other thing I would, I would say, too, that just as, if you looked at some of the articles that were a little later, too, after desegregation and after um, the schools were actually um, reorganized, I noticed there was a period of racial discord as yeah. well in the high school, I believe it was primarily. Um, and, you know, and it just goes to show that was also the time where there was a huge amount of, um, like, everything was tracked, you know. Everyone was grouped by, you know, quote, unquote, ability. Um, so I could imagine the racial imbalances in terms of the classes did not help in terms of the, the peers, right, relating to each other. And so tonight we talked about, well, what's happening in these classes where we have mixed ability grouping and how does that help you know these students feel about themselves and I think it's just awesome to yeah. see this progression that we're making I, um, I was it, fascinated to read all of the articles yeah it, it, I just sat down I made myself read them all in one go just to kind of like try to get the entire overview and one of the things that struck out, stuck out to me is so much is exactly what you just said and I pulled it out it was an article from actually 1988 yes mm -hmm. um, 
in 1988, so 10 years after the actual desegregation occurred, there was a task force, this is what the name of the task force was, mm -hmm. the Task Force on Concerns About Racial Balance and Achievement. Mm -hmm. And in 1988, the people who sat down on that task force all agreed on the statement, all children, if given equal access to knowledge, can learn. Mm -hmm. And here we are in 2018, another 30 years later, still trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. So people in this same community, 30 years ago, sat down and formed a task force to try to deal with it, deal with this, with that agreement, the same agreement that I think we all sit around this table and share, but we, we haven't tackled it in 30 years. So I, I can't think of a better time to do it than, than right now. And the other thing that I thought was really interesting, there was a, one of the other articles, there was a really long, the other thing, one thing that really struck me is how much reporting there was. Like, holy moly, wouldn't it be amazing yeah, if people were at, right, just made me realize how far we have fallen in terms of journalism, but that's another whole story. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the gentleman who was the president of the board in 1940, it says he wrote a history of the Highland Park, um, Highland Park School, the, school, the public schools of Highland Park from 1885 to 1940. And he actually wrote, there's a sentence that says, that he found that the children were able to attend schools in their respective neighborhoods and the parents could confine their school interests among people of their own surroundings. Mm -hmm. wow. mm -hmm. So that's where we were in Different 1940. Time. Like that's, that's right. I mean, but that's yeah. where, how these schools were built, right? Yeah. I mean, the schools were built, the kids were placed and that was the attitude. Like we're just gonna keep ourselves in nice little pockets of people who look like us and we're very comfortable that way. That, that's how we like it. And then we went to 78 where the state came in and said, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think all the times that I've heard about Highland Park's desegregation until we really started diving into it, it made it sound like this was something Highland Park did ourselves. Mm, we didn't no. do it ourselves. Like the state came in and said, hey, guess what guys? Guess what you're gonna do? Like this well, was- Well, we didn't even have a Civil Rights Act until 1964. Right. You so, know, so I mean, the guy in 1940, I mean, that was 25, that was a quarter century before that. Right. And, and not, not to excuse it, because there's no no excuse, but right. if you, no, no. I mean, over over time, there has been a lot of yeah, yeah. It's a just lot a of, fascinating a lot. trajectory yeah. to look at in our town. Like, yeah. I mean, it's interesting to see that kind of played out in all of these articles, um, and that it took that long. I mean, one thing that I was kind of heartened by is that even though it took the state coming in to do it, it seemed from the articles like it was happening in lots of local districts at right. the time because the state was doing this all over the state. That the resistance here seemed to be a lot less, you know, like in other communities, there was like real backlash and, um, and in Highland Park, it seemed like the, the town really just kind of came together to figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. But then like right? you said, we, we may did? have done it, but then we just kind of recreated it? it in this different, I don't know if it did. Way. It did a pretty good, it did a pretty good job compared yeah. to many. It wasn't, uh, I mean, I lived through that and it wasn't perfect. Yeah. Um, no. The big no problem is there were three community schools and everyone wanted sure. their school not right. to be closed. Right. Yeah. Um, and in fact, we've closed two of the three uh, elementary schools. But um, it w I would say it wasn't perfect, but it went better than most places. Right. And one of my big takeaways, Mark, was, um, well, not big takeaways, but one of the things I noticed was they were, like, one of the big fights was about transportation. Yep. You know, like yep. they were kind of proponents of like, well, let's just take a few kids from each of the schools and move them around. Right. Let's not like completely put everybody you know, because it's interesting to look at the different options that they had available to them, right? I mean, that would have been the kind of like, in my opinion, obviously, worst Keep option is just take a few kids and bust them from here over to there, and then we don't have to spend as much money. Um, even in, keep in mind, even in the in the 90s, uh, we had in this tiny little town school buses taking yeah, our kids. But that was a result of this. Yes, I, I, I mean that was a that was you know the outcome of you know having done it the way that it was done, which, right. you know, I agree with. I mean, that was the only way to do it. also had the budget one for it. One, one option. No, but what I, I'm sorry, but Got what it. I was getting at was at that point, the the amount that we paid for aid in lieu, which now we were just talking about this in a budget meeting, where we pay almost $1,000, or it is, it's like $1,000 now, right. that we just pay, right? We don't get anything back from the state for that. At, uh, well, we get transportation, which includes that. Right, how, how much it's of that? A tiny percent. A little bit. Tiny At that point, it was two hundred and fifty dollars, and ninety percent of it yes. was refunded by yes. was yes. 
we got from the state. And it's so I, I can, I'm sure it's not 90% that we get now. The amazing thing, though, when I said it went okay and better than most, the amazing thing was that if you had looked around this town and uh, where the, let's say, the money was and where the board lived and, and so on in, in those times, the school that you would have thought had the least chance of being the, right. the one school would have been Irving. Irving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Irving was the school that was, was left. Right. And Hamilton um, and the north side was sold and Lafayette was sold and there were a lot of unhappy people but it happened it right. made it through and it's something to be proud of here that this, this community 40 years ago could do that and by the way I just wanted to say while we're on the topic that 1988 statement that you read I was on the board <laughs> that made that that made that statement and had that uh, 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 Commitment. Mark had um, hair at the time. I, very little. <laughs> very little oh, then. Oh, no, you oh. didn't. Very little then. But, but, um. I was a sophomore in college. Well, look, look at my Facebook page. You'll see some old pictures. But, but, um, that board that I was on was very, very, very committed to that phrase, all children can learn. And, what happens, and it's, it's a lesson for this board, and it's a lesson for the community, people lose steam. Yeah, yeah. And there's turnover and change. Administration boards and focus goes to something else, yeah. and it completely loses steam, and you go back to the old ways. Right. And that's not to blame anyone, but that's what happened over the years. Yeah. It just, but it you just, would think that would have, have been a keep, given. Even then, you would have thought it, that was not... As much as people wanted to change it, there were just there was there's um, resistance. there's resistance and forces for the for we've done it in the past. Let's keep doing it this way. So and there were forces to keep it moving forward in directions which weren't good. Now some of the things that we're doing can be institutionalized, like uh, the work that Mr. Lasseter is doing. We're codifying it, yeah. so that should stick around unless anybody comes and tries to subvert that. It's the professional development that we're doing to change the mindset, that'd be my concern. If there's a lack of continuity, you could easily, I would imagine, lose steam there, no? Sure. It's, mm -hmm. it's, sure. You should. Yeah, absolutely. You, you have to be, you really have to be willing to put the energy into it, like this, this, uh, this honors option that took, that took so much um, energy for the board and the administration to put this one class in motion to do that, to actually do it. And it's just hard to be constantly, there's other things happening, you know, you don't get state aid and this happens and that happens. You just have to keep the constant pressure on to improve it because it will just fall back to the old ways. And the other thing I really, my other takeaway from this was at these different junctures where things were happening, the amount of community involvement that was brought to bear to make these yep. things happen. And I think we really, I mean, I think that's why I'm glad we're having this conversation now at the beginning of 2018. I think we really need to look at the different ways that we can get that level of community involvement again. And, yes. you know, I'm a little disheartened, I have to say, to see that no one turned out tonight because I know Mr. Lasseter did send out a letter. To um, every high school student's parent or guardian. Yeah, you know, so I, I don't know if we take that as a good sign or a bad sign. Um, or a sign, I don't know. Um, but I think it means we need to put our thinking caps on about how we're going to get people to engage on this topic. Um, and some of the, you know, some of the things that I noted in here, you know, was, um, you know, back then they engaged the PTOs. You know, they had PTOs and board members actually went out into the community and had meetings in people's homes, you know, almost like teas, you know, like when you're campaigning. You know, we may need to do stuff like that to just great. get out and have the conversations. If people aren't going to come to us, then maybe we need to figure out ways to go to them and and have these conversations, do it through different organizations, do it through POSOC, do it through the PTO, do it through right. where, you know, however we can reach parents to have these conversations, we need to right. sit down and have the conversations. And I mean, I know I'm willing to go out and do it. And it's, a, it's a good yeah. sign, it's a good sign, I'd say, that, that people weren't here to complain. Right. right. Uh, you have to remember this all started with a, a lot of un, very unhappy parents right. in the audience. 
Right. I, can I, yeah, I just want to say I think they were going out into the homes because they had to, right? You right. know, they had to get this some plan approved, so they right. had to get the buy-in. Right. And the fact that we don't, as you said, have this sort of um, you know public presence here is a good sign, which we're all acknowledging. But I'm just wondering, are we in a place now where you feel like the dis the community as a whole is pretty much behind this? Is, do you right. you know do you think that's the case or no? I, mean, I don't. I don't know what the yeah. whole community is. I think this is a community I mean, just, that's going to be divided. Yeah. Till till time's end I just it, it seems like a, this is the, such a diverse community yeah you're gonna in so many ways including philosophical thought I might be wrong about that but I'm just wondering why we're you know and I'm not looking for any issues but I'm just wondering why you're not seeing that just yet or maybe you are in other ways than not resistance the public. yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think we hmm. will see it we, we've got some other bold ideas coming down the pipe. <laughs> yeah, we've continued to hear stuff about tracking, uh, concerns about that here okay, and there. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, especially with math. I think that I've had plenty of conversations about right. yeah. you yeah. know parents' concerns about that, and their first concern is math. But yeah. um, I'm afraid to say that you know the silence is yes, deafening. You know, meaning like um, parents are maybe happy with what they've seen us do over the past few years mm -hmm. and unfortunately you know it, when that happens in the world of I'm gonna call it politics it's because complacency sets in mm -hmm. um, and then you know when something arises that irritates people or upsets people that's when they get reinvigorated and more involved so those can be kind of like the silver linings but um, it would be good to go out into the community and I know that when we ran the first time we had said that we would hold you know things like campaign teas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's not so easy to do <laughs> and it's a struggle you know sometimes just to do the work for this meeting mm -hmm. and to not you know to, to schedule other meetings outside of outside of this but um, one of the things that you read actually made me think that maybe it's not as different as we'd like to think because I know uh, I have family that recently moved to New Jersey from Staten Island and they were um, looking for a neighborhood that they would fit in and it wasn't about race it was about politics mm -hmm. they wanted the kind of neighborhood where you know um, people took care of their lawns and um, people had the flag flying outside and they just had this image and it turned out that you know what they were looking for was you know some kind of politically conservative um, type town where they wouldn't feel like outcasts and so I think that people do tend to live amongst like-minded people you know and that's not um, what segregation is that's quite the opposite so I mean that's that is what segregation right. is it's not desegregation is what I meant to say so um, yeah it seems like we always find ways to organize ourselves into groups um, and that idea of being ostracized is really you know and f you don't want to feel fearful in your community um, I unfortunately see more of that as I get older not less um, I, I don't know if that's one of the reasons why people you know might not be coming to the meetings you know they feel like um, my opinion isn't gonna matter you know this board is one one mind and I'm not gonna disagree I'm not going to have any chance of being heard um, right so Mike's invitation was to the to the students and their parents to come and listen and share their experiences and we would like to hear people's experiences and so Maybe that's opening up a can of worms, and you know, maybe there would be some negativity to it. I like worms. That's fine. All right. We'd like to hear it. So. Yeah. Well, I think, as you said, Darcy, it's about being proactive, really, especially going as we go through the process, right? And knowing that there are, will be kinks and bumps, and but really knowing, contextualize what are our kinks and bumps. You know, mm -hmm. we can do the research and see what happens when schools and districts see track, and how to try to avoid some of the pitfalls, but. I guess a lot of the issues will be very specific here, even to Highland Park, in terms right. of what we may see. Yeah, and the, you know, from the research I've done, and I'm sure from the research you've done, like this is what happens in in districts that desegregate. I mean, they, uh, yeah, you resegregate inside the school. It's not. This is not. We're not new. We're not special. We didn't. We didn't create this. You know, this is. Well, like I said, they're always going to find. The people are always going to find a way to reorganize right. around like-minded people. Right. Yeah. 
So we have a lot to work, a lot of work to do this year. Yeah, it's worth doing. So that's it there. Uh, the last item really on our meeting agenda was just scheduling. And we talked about aiming to have bi-monthly meetings. So I will be sending out an email on that soon. I do have one follow-up item, brand new. Okay. Piggyback off the point you made about the SNAP trying to find uh, reduced costs for folks to get on the internet. Mm -hmm. So she did finally hit something, uh, oh, Altice, Altice, which is a company I believe just, just purchased Optimum, yeah, cable, right. was Cablevision, yeah, your name. has a, um, an offer and Miss Knapp is distributing letters tomorrow to those who qualify for free and reduced lunch. The letter will read, uh, it's just very short, I'll read it out loud. A company by the name of Altice is offering a great opportunity to our families who qualify for the National School Lunch Program. You can receive Altice USA's high-speed internet service for $14.99 a month. And then included in the letter will be the press release, um, a copy of the lunch determination letter that has to be presented and instructions on how to apply. So it's a small start. It's a, yeah, yeah a I mean, high-speed internet by itself might, what, be, what, $50, $80? I don't even know. What would it be? Through the company, it's 80 for the first two years. Wow. So yeah, so that's a pretty good that's discount. Great, that's yeah. a big discount. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's something. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, so that brings us to public comment. Keith, you got anything for us? You know what to do, so I'm not going to go through my whole rigmarole. I don't think anybody's going to tackle you on your way to the podium. I think you're good. Hi, everybody. Hi, Keith. Keith Presti, Highland Park Education Association President. Uh, just a couple quick things. I just wanted to... Um, go back to the calendar and just offer just where we were coming from. In fact, I think I heard the board say that they didn't want to have additional weeks of impact um, with the conferences and the Thanksgiving, all that stuff. So we felt like to just impact one week completely was better than three weeks. So um, that's why most people recommended to go back to attaching it to the teachers convention. Um, as far as the uh, policy, electronic communication, thank you for hearing what I said last time. Um, I would just um, add that in, the, in that same section where you're talking about emails, uh, it says uh, students district email address if the student has one. So then the question is what if they don't have one, I guess? Um, Should we, do you think it would be helpful to specify then the other email address may be used or then the student's personal email address may be used? Yeah, oh, yeah, that, yeah that I sense. mean, that yeah. would be the question I guess people would have is like, Should I just not do it? Can then you just not email the student ah. or is there another means of communication with that student? Very good point. So maybe um, that was a first reading one, so I will propose a change to that one to make that clear. Okay. If, if that's, I mean, right. the board can fine. obviously discuss that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we can change it between first and second reading. There's yeah, not yeah, a problem. Right. So yeah. if you if you come up with a su like suggested change language, whatever, send it to Anne. Sure. Oh, okay. And then the other thing that that, um, uh, that some of the members brought up um, when they reviewed the policy was it, the policy is not specific to um, apps that mm -hmm. uh, staff and students use um, for different communication. Like, there's the Remind app. There's Band, there's Edmodo, there's all these different th uh, things that people use. Um, so, because they're not really social media, there's a social media section. Um, so I don't know where the board is on that or what and needs how, to be. And how are that, those being used? Like, are those approved? Did teachers yeah, they're, approve well, they're those approved with their the building principal, principles? Mr. Last, if they come, if a teacher wants to use Remind, Mr. Laster will approve it, likely. And it, we just, that's it. Moves forward. You know, I think I tried to um, suggest that that be covered in the texting section about whether, what, you know, it applies to texting, whether it's by uh, the native 
texting application on the phone or a third party application. But maybe you have a suggestion for making that more clear. I mean, what is a third party texting application? And remind, I know, you know, Bloom's isn't exactly could, a testing. And we get, a, a prob we get in trouble like listing them out because no, no, they change right. yeah. so quickly or. But is know. there a better way to describe it? Like, uh, C communications apps or something like Blooms isn't actually texting. It's, you know, it's a little app you get on your phone and teacher sends around photographs or whatever. Yeah, I mean, these are great things for us to think about <laughs> but between now and yes. I guess second reading and stuff. Um, so it, p potentially it could be addressed in the uh, cellular telephone section, except it's not specific to, you know, it can yeah. be on the phone, it can be on your iPad, it can be on your computer. So, um, and then something else that I just thought of when, oh, um, because uh, primarily the, the policy is about, um, you know, specifying what type of direct contact a staff member can have with a student and under what circumstances and what, under what programs and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, it's very specific about personal social media, but, and I think I might have said last time, the staff has um, social media accounts for their classrooms, whether it be a Facebook or an Instagram uh, okay. or a Twitter or something. And, you know, and we have been encouraged to use them in the district, mm -hmm. um, which I think is a great thing because that's where our students are right now. Right. Um, so, so obviously if we're using one that's specific to the classroom, I'm assuming that that you know, is okay with the policy. However, every thing now has some form of direct messaging a right. attached to it. Right. So okay. there's that possibility still okay. of a direct message between a staff member and a student. So all kinds of room for misinterpretation here. We, I mean, we certainly didn't mean to rule that out. I think we, we took out the, there was a proposal to have texting only be allowed to groups of students, but then it was thought that that was just gonna be too cumbersome. If someone needs to say like, the bus is leaving, where are you? Um, so yeah, we need to deal with the direct messaging thing. That's a lot of language to think about. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, wanna, you... <laughs> if you wanna email me any suggestions you have, I will also come up, try to come up with my own and yeah. circulate those, but I'd love to hear your suggestions if you have any. Sure, yeah, th that was just some of the stuff that was coming up as I was talking to okay. staff about it. So I, I mean, I wonder if next time we have a policy meeting and we decide that we're going to propose changes to a personnel-related policy, we should just you know, hit you up with an email and let sure. you know. Would that be like one way of getting in touch with you <laughs> earlier on? Yes. Okay. okay. Use yeah. your Remind app. I'll use my Remind app, yes, <laughs> to direct message you yes. at your personal email. <laughs> that would be fine. Thank you. Um, okay. And then on a more serious note, um, I just would like to say that, you know, people were very, con you know, obviously, as everybody was concerned with the incidents that happened in Florida. And, you know, there's been a lot of from the people that I've spoken to, concern in the buildings between, you know, among staff members about, you know, security and, and some concerns that have come up. So um, I just want to make the board aware of that and also that, you know, we would like to be in the conversation of uh, anything that we, we might see potentially, you know, a problem or uh, recommend. I'm sure there are people on committees of different kinds, but um, just saying that I have heard a lot of concern in the buildings. So, hey Keith. Um, yeah. So uh, we have a safety committee, and I've moved the meeting from March 29th to I think it's the third, fourth, fifteenth. I have to look at my calendar, but it's a couple of weeks ahead at that time. You, the HPEA has representatives um, on the committee. I, Janie Mazur is one of them. I can give you a list of those yeah, names. Yeah, you can give me a, the names that are on that committee. I think it would be helpful if they can relay those concerns to the committee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and then on a kind of positive note with that, um, it, uh, Nicole Rizzo, who is our assistant director for the musical, saw on one of her a Facebook page, I guess, about uh, from a... Uh, an alum from the uh, Snowman Douglas School who is an actor who um, was reaching out to people and said that the drama club is very important in that school um, and that they, were, they would love to see some support and encouragement from different actors, 
school drama clubs, theaters, and stuff like that. Um, so the idea that has come up in the drama club is to um, dedicate um, a full page in the playbill with a picture of our cast with an inspirational quote and have all the cast members sign it and then we're going to send it to nice. the drama club there. So I thought you'd like That's to know really that. Nice. Yes. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. <clears throat> we're always so glad when you're here. We're lone when you're, lonely when you're not. <laughs> I said, we're always so glad when you're here. We're lonely when you're not. Uh, okay, so we will move on to our board action items. Michelle, could you move the curriculum and instruction? Before we get to that, I am sorry to interrupt. No, okay. I noticed an error on the agenda. Oh. We did not copy the resolution to approve the DOE DPR file from the last board agenda to this one. Oh dear. So I'd like to write it in to old business. Okay. It's not a new item in that the board discussed this last week, or I'm sorry, last meeting. We just left it off the agenda. Where was it last time? It was under my report, superintendent's report, on gotcha. February 12th. Okay. So yeah. uh, Ms. Ruffalo and I are recommending we place it under old business. Okay. Okay. Alrighty. Okay, um, so Michelle, could you move the curriculum and instruction items? Yes. I would like to move items one through eight. Right, and with the change to number two as previously noted, and I will give Linda yes, that language that we read I think in. Eight is also an addition. From last time. Okay. All right. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? No? Okay. Seeing none, Linda, could we please have a roll call? Sorry. Where's my microphone? Where's my microphone? Ms. Morosti? Yes. Ms. Coleman? Yes. Ms. Gowan? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Mr. Magaziner? So, uh, yes for one and two and three A and B and D and E, and abstain from three C. And then uh, yes to the rest. Ms. McFadden Di Nicola? Yes. Ms. Pietro Bono? Yes. Mr. Roslevich? Abstain on five and yes to the remainder. Okay, uh, finance and facilities. Mark, could you move that for us? Yeah, I'd like to move items one through 21. Okay, is there a second? Second. Any discussion? No? All right, seeing none, Linda, could we have a roll call? Ms. Samarusti? Yes. Ms. Coleman? Yes. Ms. Gowan? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Mr. Magaziner? Yes. Ms. McFadden Di Nicola? Yes. Ms. Pietro Bono? Yes. Mr. Roslevich? Yes. Okay. Personnel? Judy? I'd like to move items 1 through 23. Okay. Uh, is there a second? Second. Any discussion? No. Seeing none. Linda, could I have a roll call? Ms. Simarusti? Yes. Ms. Coleman? Yes. Ms. Gowan? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Mr. Magaziner? Yes. Ms. McFadden Di Nicola? Yes. Ms. Pietro Bono? Yes. Mr. Roslevich? Yes. And Anne, policies. Yes, I'd like to move items one and two. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? No. Again, seeing none. Uh, Linda, can we have a roll call? Mr. Marusti? Yes. Ms. Coleman? Yes. Ms. Gowan? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Mr. Magaziner? Yes. Ms. McFadden Di Nicola? Yes. Ms. Pietro Bono? Yes. Mr. Roslevich? Yes. Okay, so that brings us to our uh, board liaison reports. It's getting a little late. I think we're all a little tired, so we'll just kind of cruise through these. Um, uh, Scott, do we have anything from Joshua Chen? Meetings tomorrow. Josh will be some? attending. All right, so we'll hear something next month. Michelle, any action with our uh, HPTV folks? This will be or? really cruisy. Yeah, there's nothing. <laughs> nothing from either one of those two. Uh, Although, we, I did get an e interesting email from Gary 
right? Yeah. Did you get that too? <clears throat> I did. Yeah. I saw that. yeah. Um, I tried that. to find it and I couldn't <clears throat> couldn't locate Let's it. Let's see. Email. Uh, yeah, he emailed us about um, like a possible collaboration with the folks who did the uh, Backpack Full of Cash movie. Right, but then it seemed like maybe things fell through a little bit. But then I he would get back, get back. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so hopefully, hopefully he's putting together something. Yeah, it sounds like I Gary's just, got something up his sleeve. I guess so I was waiting for that would be kind of cool material to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that sounds um, exciting. Yeah. All right. Um, Rob, HPEF. Met last week, uh, and yes, uh, so we did approve. Um, uh, four grants from the Ed Foundation. Thank you. Uh, they're also planning uh, their spring fundraiser, which is going to be in May. I don't think it's been announced yet, so I'm not going to steal their thunder, but it should be <laughs> exciting. All righty. Uh, Judy, anything from the Commission for Universal Access? Um, yes. So I went last week, and I just wanted to follow up on something I discussed last time but failed to follow up on. So <laughs> remember I was talking about um, the fact that the commission was open to um, um, people who wanted to apply for grants, teachers that wanted to apply for grants. Um, and uh, so basically one of the functions of the commission is to partner with the schools to facilitate physical and social inclusion of individuals with disabilities. So basically they're open to hearing any requests from teachers that fit that. So if, if it's a, a, a um, a program or something that they need for their classroom or something that would enhance physical and social inc inclusion. They're open to that. Um, so they meet um, normally, if it's not a holiday, the third Monday of the month at 7.30 in Borough Hall. Um, and anyone um, that wants to, you know, bring something to them sh comes to the meeting. Now Monique did that last year with um, a summer, uh, summer arts camp. Um, and presented and, and the commission was able to help fund that. So it, it's really a great opportunity um, if there's something that, that a teacher has an idea about. Um, I looked on their website, they do have an email, which is universalaccesshp at gmail.com. Um, Tara Canavera is the uh, chairperson, um, so you can also reach out to her, but you would need to, Anyone that's interested would need to come and do just a short little presentation. Right. So has that, does Scott have that information to disseminate to the principals, to disseminate to the teachers? Mm, yeah. I but you can give it to me. I will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be great. That's great. Uh, okay. Thanks, Judy. Sure. Uh, does Rebecca have anything for us from the... Yeah, she placed uh, dish files in the board drive, so please okay. take a look. Rebecca has dutifully been attending library meetings. Fabulous. Anything you remember that you can share with no, us? Nothing, no, nothing, okay. nothing of light. I, I know that they're in the throes of discussing the relocation of the library, but nothing's been decided. Okay. Uh, I don't have anything for shared services, although saying this did make me remember that I got a letter from the mayor saying, you've been appointed to this thing. Come and sign your letter or something, and I haven't done that, so maybe I should go do that. Maybe if I go sign my letter, maybe we'll have a meeting. Maybe that's what I'm supposed to do. Could I pop in with a question about the library? Is the, is the district taking any kind of position on the relocation of the library? I mean, I always, speaking for myself personally, it seems like it's well located now right next to the high school where, you know, lots of kids go there after school. Um, I was just wondering if we will be piping up in any of those discussions. If, if there's a room or a place for them to be? Well, no, if the, if the library is going to be relocated. I mean, you know, we've heard oh, in I'm town sorry. about some of the possible relocation spots, or one in particular. And I'm wondering if the district is going to express a view or take part in discussions about the wisdom of the relocation. Uh, look, I have an opinion, but I had no knowledge of where they're thinking of relocating. If it's something... I think it's on Main Street. It's worth considering. Yeah, I mean, I, I can look into it. That's um, not... Oh, that's, that's Mark, different now? Uh, well, you, it's different the, meeting now. Was, the meeting was tonight, uh, so, and my wife attends the meeting. She's a member of the uh. library board. I've heard nothing from her about a relocation. She's been at all of the last dozen meetings. So perhaps they're having... A, I shouldn't say this in public. <laughs> I won't. Um, so perhaps there's some discussion going on that's not being done at the library board. Uh, we were assured um, by various uh, people in 
town on, the ver on bo other boards uh, that the uh, potential of moving the library to uh, to Raritan between second and third had kind of gone away because for a variety of reasons. I don't know if that's true, but I, 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 I'll, I'm going to check when I get home tonight. <laughs> um, the, any movement of the library from that building that would cause the building to get turned into condos, which was the plan of that developer, um, is against the uh, laws of the state of New Jersey. Uh, that, that building is on a uh, residential A lot, right. and condos aren't allowed there. And there's a number of neighbors around that building, including me, who uh, <laughs> would plan to uh, take legal action if the town tried to do that. But who knows? I mean, anything's possible. I just wonder if, if we, as a district, want to express any sort of view about that. I mean, I do, um, I know there's just a ton of kids that go to the library after school. Yep. And, you know, although between 2nd and 3rd Avenue on Raritan, whether or not that's still under consideration, that's not far from the perspective of a normal human adult. You know, we know that middle schoolers don't always want to walk, and if it's not convenient, they might not go. Or bad so, weather. Or bad weather, or, you know, whatever. But middle schools, all, we know what they're like, because we were them. I think we'd have to wait till we, you know, I mean, I think everything is so nebulous right now, it would be impossible. But, I mean, I didn't there, this is what Mark and I have been, and, oh. and Rob and Scott have been talking, trying to talk to Susie and Gail about, is the idea of getting better information about these things. Great. You know, so... The idea would be that hopefully there's a better flow of information and if you know some proposal came up that you know we wanted to weigh in on we'd have the opportunity to weigh in on it so wonderful thank you for making sure that happens I don't think, try. <laughs> trying to I don't think kids would want to walk a greater distance I agree. for the same library right. oh right. right it would have to have something right if it was spectacular right. maybe they would so, so. right so that's yeah so let's, let's cross that's what they that that's what they had talked to about not a at 10 o'clock hypothetically no, gotcha no, just, for sure i just wanted to add to that that you know there is a building being built around south 8th south 7th that is a teen recreation center i yeah. believe that's the plan. right yeah yeah so i don't think that that would have anything to do with no. a future library plan no yeah no right Okay, um, Ruth's not here to talk to us about CPAC. Um, oh, we still have Sharice's name on there for parents of students of color. There's a bit of an oversight. Uh, we need to make sure that's uh, fixed yes, for next time. Definitely. Uh, uh, they'll be, yeah, they'll be meeting Wednesday, so I'll have an update the next meeting. Okay. Uh, Anne, anything from Human Relations Committee? Not too much. Um, they met last Wednesday. I was not present, but I have the minutes here. Um, as we've discussed before, they're running a, an occasional book club series. The next one will be on March 29th. I'm realizing here that I don't know where it is. Possibly the library, possibly Borough Hall. But if anyone is interested, you can go to the Facebook page for the and search for or go to Facebook and search for Highland Park Human Relations Commission. You'll get a page for the commission. It'll have all the details. Um, but anyway, on March 29th, at the location that I, I am not sure about, they'll be uh, discussing um, white rage. Uh, and Lucinda Holt is going to be, I think, leading the discussion. Um, let me see. There was another, I, I realize my notes here are not as clear as they could be. Um, there is another uh, interesting event happening on April 15th at the library. The Human Relations Commission, I guess, is... I'm not sure what their role is. Maybe they're just advertising it. Maybe they're co-sponsoring it. But an author named Jerry Zhang is going to be there reading uh, a new children's book, um, which, although it is not, uh, Mr. Zhang says it's not about Asian culture, it does feature a strong Asian-American heroine. Um, so that might be of interest to people. And I, of course, realize as I'm saying this, I don't know what the age group is for this book. Um, but... If you're interested, April 15th, Sunday, at the library, 1.30. Um, check it out. And I believe that, yeah, that's it for uh, directly school-relevant items. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Mark, anything from Board of Health? Yeah, we met uh, the February 8th. I'll give you the uh, short version. The, uh, the student reps and a number of the members of the Board of Health were very interested in the middle school and high school health, sex ed, and mental health uh, curriculums and action. And I discussed with Scott, and um, just to be brief about it, um, we are rewriting the, uh, or writing the curriculum, the health curriculum, middle school and high school, 
and uh, the, the students uh, and some of the members who've had uh, students in the high school years past talked very highly of this teen pep, pre teen pep program, which is a curriculum for high school uh, health and strongly urged us to be looking at that as a model curriculum it's used around the state, uh, which died, as many other things did around here, about five years ago, if, uh, if you get the drift. And um, uh, so we, uh, I've t again talked to Scott about it, and hopefully we'll take that up and be looking at that as an appropriate, uh, appropriate started curriculum for the high school. So the good news is uh, we, we are scheduled to write middle and high school health, rewrite health curriculum Monday the 19th of March, Thursday the 22nd, Friday the 23rd, and at 1 o'clock Elizabeth Azamoa, who ran the Team Pet program, is going to be sitting in with those writers from 1 to 2.30 to see how we might be able to integrate it formally into the curriculum. Fabulous. Yeah. Oh, I just want to add two other things yes. related to yes. uh, family and sex ed. Um, I've tasked Susie Boudine, who, besides directing the ESL program and our special needs yep. uh, program, also works with the nurses. Right. And she is speaking with them about um, distributing condoms to students at the middle and high school who might uh, be interested. She got feedback from the nurses who recommended that the teen center take responsibility for that approach. That that um, matter, and they are now talking amongst each other about how they would proceed to do that. Now, I recognize that's not, that's, you know, at 10 o'clock for me to throw that out there is not. I, I didn't want to bring it up. I wanted <laughs> to do the short version, but there's a tremendous amount of, um, of um, interest um, by those reps and by the members of the Board of Health in much better sex, sex, sex education through the nurses and or through the Teen Center, and uh, particularly, um, particularly condoms or uh, more education. So uh, I, I'd be very happy to report that back to them. That at least we're we're taking that very seriously. And I'll get back to the board when I have a better handle Fabulous. on the direction Thank the Teen you. Center's thinking of going. And my question well. would be, why wouldn't the nurse and the Teen Center have them available? Good point. Exactly. Right. Why does it have to be an either or? Well, this is what the nurses are giving us in terms of feedback. It could be a comfort level could be um, what they feel is a lack of um, education about how to guide or coach, which the teen center folks might have based on their experiences, especially with the teen pet program. Is it possible let's, let's, for us to continue the conversation with our health education consultant. staff? Let's let the process unfold. Yeah. But I agree. Okay. I agree. I agree. We have to have other people involved before we yeah. make a hard line decision on it. All right. Yeah. Not just that it's 10 o'clock at night. But <laughs> I think that the people who brought this up repeatedly at those meetings would be, would be pleased if there were some place in our school system where education and materials were available to them. That's, re that's really the point. Right. Not both, too much both, to ask. Two, yes. Both of those shouldn't things. Shouldn't be. No. It shouldn't, both be of those things. shouldn't be too much The Team Pep used to run at uh, zero period. Oh. So kids used to come in at, uh, I see. What, what time was that, seven? No, no. <laughs> seven. Something seven. like that. Seven. That's dedication. They, but they did. Oh, it was they early. Did do, yeah, it was right. early. They did, right. they, they, they did it. Well, the right subject will get you out of bed. Yep. <laughs> So. <laughs> Those kids, yes. That <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. Yes, let's yeah. move on. Uh, <laughs> after hours, <laughs> board after hours. Late, yeah. uh, Rob, do you have anything for us for the green team? I uh, don't have any. I'm sorry, Mark, were you done? I'm sorry. I am done. Okay. I'm done. <laughs> I'm finished. I'm in trouble. I don't have anything John's new first on. meeting, everyone. Behave. Come on. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Nothing new on the green team, but I am still looking for the minutes. Did you get the minutes from the... January 20th? Okay. So I'm still waiting for the minutes from the last meeting to send it out to everyone else. Okay. So nothing new to report, though. All right. Um, uh, so we'll be talking, obviously, a little later about the Delegate Assembly Resolution, so I'll skip my, uh, my little presentation there, since it'll be covered in old business. And so that brings us back to you, Rob. 
did the last meeting was February 13th. I wasn't able to attend. That was run by Jonathan Bush. It was about what? crisis management. The next meeting is the March 7th one that you sent the reminder about. Hopefully there's some people on that because that's the unsung Yeah, Ruth had terrorist. actually expressed interest in going also. But then I realized, Scott, that we probably have to RSVP for me and Ruth. Or do we just have enough spots for all of us? Scott? Hi. Oh, so sorry. That's okay. I'm not cheating. Go ahead. Uh, um, Rob just brought up the... Um, March 7th. Uh, yes, thank you. March 7th. Um, student recognition parents. thing. Um, it's just me and Ruth that were available to go. Do okay. we need to? What do we need to do? I'll RSVP as long as you can give me those names. Okay. It's just me and Ruth. By email. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah, yeah. I'll just. You know what? I'll just uh, email Julia to Hurst. Okay. Take care of that. Apologies. Awesome. No. No worries. Okay. Um, so I don't have anything in particular tonight for my president's report. Uh, so the only we have on the agenda the delegate my, the delegate assembly resolution and then we're adding the um, DPR. Correct. Right? Did I get that acronym right? I'm always afraid I'll get them. Yeah. Yep. Right. Uh, so what language do you want to add for the? Do you have that? Oh, sorry. Oh, um, go ahead. Sorry. I move that the board of education accept the recommendation of the superintendent to approve the submission of the CUSAC district performance report to the New Jersey Department of Education. Alrighty, and that was on our agenda last time, just didn't get moved forward, so this isn't something new. We're, it was just a, an oversight not putting it on there. Is, um, this, well, is this the DPR report that had the, we were wondering about the one column where it was like, we look like we scored 82 out of 164, yes. and now we're really scoring like 83 out of 100? Yes. Okay. All under control. Great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, does anybody have any questions about the delegate assembly resolution? We went over it in depth last week. We don't need to do it again at 10 o'clock at night if everybody's okay with it. Okay, no? No nagging questions have come up in the last two weeks? I'll sleep fine. Okay, good. Um, and then we have the DPR. So um, can, we just, can I just move both of those at once, Linda? Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm just going to do it myself. Um, I'm going to move A and B under old business. I'll uh, second. Second. Oh, she Ooh, beat you to it, Rob. Very well. <laughs> Is there any discussion? No, nope. seeing none. Linda, can we have a roll call? Ms. Simaresti? Yes. Ms. Coleman? Yes. Ms. Gowan? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Mr. Magaziner? Yes. Ms. McFadden Di Nicola? Yes. Ms. Pietro Bono? Yes. Mr. Roslovich? Yes. Uh, anybody have anything they want to add for new business? I just have a question. Yes, ma'am. So after the safety committee meets, will you be reporting back to us about anything that's, any changes that will be happening with the school? Sure. Uh, I don't anticipate any major changes. I had a chance to meet with the leadership team right after the event. And um, a lot of what we have to do is do be more uh, consistent, right. implementing the things we have in practice. Okay. But I'll definitely report back. Thank you. Okay. Great. Anybody else have anything? You know, I had one. This is new business we're on? Yes. This? Okay, new business. Sorry. I'll be really quick. Um, I went to the open house for the Fuse, uh, Fuse program at Bartle. It was, it was fantastic. Um, there was discussion. Uh, it, it was uh, Dr. Nicosia and, a bunch, and several other people, teachers, a, a teacher, some community members. Um, there was a lot of discussion about how to sort of retain and strengthen our middle school uh, makerspace program now that we have a really good thing going at Bartle. So I, I, I would anticipate there'll be lots of suggestions coming in about that and recommendations. Um, uh, somebody who, uh, there was a professor there, a physics professor from Rutgers, I'm so sorry, if I don't have his name here and I've, I've just forgotten it. He expressed some concern or some interest in seeing if Highland Park wanted to get involved in the, uh, I'm not sure if it's the Westinghouse Science Fair now or the Intel Science Fair, the national one, and there was a New Jersey uh, regional competition, right. March 10th, Saturday at Rutgers. Um, he suggested that maybe some board members would want to go, see what it's all about. And it sounds like you have some input. Okay. Yeah, it's the Intel. Oh. No, yeah, it's Intel now. now? Okay. Yeah. I think Nokia is sponsoring part of the New Jersey regional contest. It's just, there's a whole lot of corporate sponsors. <laughs> so, but this, this, it was the impression of this uh, physics professor that Highland Park typically does not 
uh, at least, I, I, I guess this is the only route for a student to get to the Intel competition. Was Dr. Nikosha there for that conversation? Oh, yeah, yeah, she was there oh, for good. that. Yeah, so she, I'll, I'll follow up with her tomorrow. Right, right, sure. But if any board members are interested, I was thinking about trying to go on March 10th and uh, taking a look around. It's at the College Ave gym, and I can forward information to you guys in written form. I would love to see. Yeah, it sounded pretty exciting. The, 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 I looked at some of the exhibit listings, and they're incredibly complicated. Really? But this professor is assuring me that this is stuff that our students can do. They definitely can get there. So that's exciting. Yeah. Okay, so I don't want to, I don't want to talk about this now, but remind me to talk about this next time. The yoga mindfulness program. Scott, you and I had a brief aside con conversation about it the other day. And uh, maybe next meeting we can begin to talk about that. There, there are some efforts that are going on in neighboring school districts, and um, I think there's some good opportunities for us to uh, put something together. That for would, students. For to students, especially, particularly kids that may have um, stress, stress, and anxiety, discipline issues. I mean. <laughs> Could could be good for everybody, actually. But like yeah, just, I just got just got an email from Metro Lundy, mm -hmm. right? Who owns the yep. joint? And uh, we were hooking up uh, to talk about this. Yeah. So I thought maybe you had already mentioned something to her. No, just uh, no. Well, she Not, reached out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I know that she is running a program at Piscataway High School. Mm -hmm. She talks so, about that in her email. Right. Okay. So I, I gave her some dates to, to come by. Actually, I'd like to come to her place. I pass it on my runs every morning. So uh, I'm there curious to early. see oh, yeah. <laughs> what it looks well, like. So now you don't have to remind me to talk about it next time. We've talked think, about it. I don't it. think we, 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 So we started. Good stuff. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? No? All right. We have no public for public comment. So that brings us to adjournment. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Can't second. Get a second. Oh, sorry. <laughs> second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.